Once again, I've been challenged and privileged by the opportunity to present thoughts, reflections, facts, goals on this day of Tisha B'Av. This is the 35th year that I've pre been presenting such presentations at my former shul, Shomri Amun of Baltimore, and for the Orthodox Union for the past many years. Today, because of various circumstances, I am pre-recording this presentation several weeks before Tisha B'Av, but it will be presented to the public on Tisha B'Av itself. I want to begin by thanking the family that has been dedicating these presentations for some years now, and they are Richard and Deborah Parkoff, in memory of Richard's parents, Avram ben Yitzchak HaKohen, Olav HaShalom, and Rochel Bluma Bas Yehoshua, Aleha HaShalom. We thank the Parkoff family for their generosity and support. I also must thank an entire list of people, which include the lay and professional leadership of the Orthodox Union. I want to especially mention the current new president of the OU, Mitchell Ader, and the executive vice president, Rabbi Moshe Hauer, and the executive vice president, Rabbi J Joshua Joseph. Finally, although there are many other people to thank, I must mention the invaluable assistance of my assistant, Mrs. Yocheved Goldberg. As in past years, we will recite together several kinos, traditional ones that can be found in a standard edition of the kinos. And I very much recommend, if you haven't already obtained the kinote Misores Horav, which is available through OU Press, because that is the actual edition of the kinos that we will be following. This edition has several advantages. Number one, it includes all the kinos in the Ashkenaz tradition. It also includes supplemental kinos, kinos on the occasion of the Holocaust. And it contains the inspirational commentary of Rav Soloveitchik, edited by the many, many recordings of his years of explicating and emotionally transforming the day of Tisha B'Av with his brilliant insights. Vasilevichik's recordings were edited so ably by Simon Posner, and for that reason alone, it's worthwhile obtaining this edition. But it also contains the translation of the Kinos, which I personally did myself, was a very difficult task, but we will be referring to that translation from time to time as well. So try to get your copy, or if you haven't gotten it already, and study it. It's the worthwhile way to spend the day of Tisha B'Av, looking especially at Rasalevich's comments at the text as I've translated them. I'd like to begin with a bit of an overview, which I've culled mostly from an absolutely heartwarming, long essay contained in the Sefer Kedushas Levi. Kedushas Levi was written by one of the early Hasidic masters, Rabbi Levi Yitzchak of Berdichev. As so often happens with great Jewish leaders, there are many anecdotes and inspiring stories that have been told about him, his righteousness, his kindness, his warmth, his joy, 
his attempt to always justify people who are not necessarily living up to the path of the Torah, but he still saw the good in them in so many ways. Less known than all of these anecdotes are his actual writings, and it is one of them that I will refer to at first today. There are various many editions of the Kedusha Slevi of this wonderful work. The one I have in my hands, Kedusha Slevi, has many, many sections. It's probably about 500 pages, all told. And I'm referring to a section of about four, four or five pages in his commentary on Pirkei Avos, Ethics of the Fathers, and the Parshios Matos Mas'e. And this is what he has to say. He begins by saying, Lo habayshan lo meid velo hakapton A person who is ashamed to ask questions can never study, can never learn. You must learn to ask questions. And if you're a teacher, you can't be a kapdan. You can't be impatient. You have to have patience. The student must ask questions, provocative questions. And the scholar, the teacher, must not shirk questions. No matter how naive the questions might be, no matter how challenging the questions might be, no matter how skeptical the questions might be, we must deal with questions and allow for them to be asked. So here's the question that he asks. He begins with two passages in the Talmud. One is in the tractate of Tainus, Maseches Tainus, Daflam and Amid Beis. And this one, of course, is obviously relevant to our experience at this moment, on this day of Tisha B'Av, Tuf Shin Pei Gimel, the year 2023, by the secular calendar. And it reads, Kol hamisabel al churbano shel Yerushalayim. Whoever mourns, truly mourns, sincerely mourns the destruction of historical Jerusalem, zoche veroe v'simchasa. He will be privileged to see the joy of a rebuilt Jerusalem, of a rebuilt Yerushalayim. But someone who does not mourn for Jerusalem will not be privileged to see its eventual rebuilding, its eventual joy. And the Talmud quotes a pasuk to support this view. Then, Rav Levi Yitzchel goes on to another Talmudic passage, Meseches Brochos, Perekoroa, which reads as follows, V'yolam yishtadel odom lorutz l'gras melochim. A person should always try to rush to a parade in which kings, queens, royalty appears in the parade. And one might think that a Jewish person should run to any display of Jewish royalty, a king of Israel. But the Talmud goes on and says, no. V'lo likras malche Yisrael bilvad, ela afilu likras malche umos ha'olam. One should even attend these royal parades of non-Jewish kings. One is in Great Britain uh, this year, the new king, King Charles, to go and to see his royalty on display when he comes to greet the people, when he participates in a parade or some ceremony, it's important for a Jewish person to go and attend and see that, uh, that scene. It's a very inspiring scene to see royalty in action. Why? Shema Yizke, She'im Yizke Yavrin. Because if you begin to go to royal occasions, even royal occasions, of royalty that's not your royalty, it's not your nation, it's not your people. It's another people that are celebrating their king, their queen. Attend that too. 
because once you get accustomed to seeing royalty in action, you will become eventually inspired. Jewish people have no king at this moment in history. But one day we will. One day the kingdom of based of it, of the house of David, will be restored. And then we will appreciate royalty all the more because we are accustomed to seeing royalty even among other nations of the world. These are the two Talmudic passages with which Rav Levi Yitzchak begins his long discussion and analysis. And the analysis is based upon a powerful question that he asks. Suppose there's a person, a Jewish person, who is very pious, very medakdeik b'mitzvos, very careful to do everything just right. He keeps the Shabbos, he prays three times a day. He is careful about what he eats and where he eats. He keeps all the mitzvot to the extent that he can, to the extent that we can expect of any human being. Gives charity, pursues good. There's so many good things. But for whatever reason, he's not inspired to mourn for Yerushalayim. Comes Tisha B'Av, he fasts like all good Jews fast on Tisha B'Av. But he's not especially moved to mourn. The hisabel to mourn requires a sincere, profound, emotional experience. A mourner, a person in grief, is, is, is rent with grief. He's torn apart. He can't function. He's crying. He's hysterical. He can't get to that degree. He can't be misabel. He, for him, Tisha B'Av is not a transformative experience in which he's sitting on the ground and crying authentically. He may go through the motions, but that's about it. But then there's a Talmud telling us that such a wonderful person, just because he can't get to that depth of emotion that's required, the Hisabel al Yerushalayim, should be denied the privilege of seeing the rebuilt Yerushalayim, denied the privilege of, of seeing the Geula, seeing it all in reality in his own lifetime. Why should he be punished, so to speak, simply for not being able to mourn? Well, the person who does not attend royal parades doesn't want to be bothered with seeing, you know, King Charles or Queen Elizabeth or whomever. He's not interested in that. He's a good person in every other way, generous and kind, a wonderful Jew. Just because of that, he won't be privileged to see the glory of a restored kingdom of David. He finds that difficult to understand. So he goes about by saying, in answer to this question, that there are three, not one, but three aspects of the mourning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, of the day of Tisha B'Av, the entire experience of mourning for the destruction of the temples. And he says, there are three things we mourn for. We mourn for the destroyed temples. Beis HaMikdosh HaRishon, Beis HaMikdosh HaSheni one destroyed by the Babylonians, one destroyed by the Romans. We mourn that, we mourn the temple. We also mourn the city of Jerusalem. We mourn the city of Jerusalem itself. Mesos Kol it's such a wonderful, wonderful city, it was in its peak. And we mourn that we would like to see Jerusalem rebuilt. Uvenei Jerusalem Ir HaKodesh, Bimheir Oviyomeinu. And we also mourn the loss of the state of Jerusalem, of, of Israel, the nation of Israel, the people, the land. To some extent, of course, the land has been restored to the Jewish people in our time. There is a state of Israel, and we do govern over a portion of the original biblical land. In terms of the city of Jerusalem, we have seen it be, being rebuilt as we speak. New construction, new parks, new synagogues, new hospitals, new homes, all around the city. When it comes to the temple, of course, we, we're not there yet. We're still mourning that. But he points out that when we mourn temple, city, or land, there are two ways, two modes of expression. We could mourn the temple 
Oh, because it was a beautiful temple. You still see the ruins of Herod's temple, of the second temple. It was a mighty structure. It was a wonderful thing to behold. When we mourn Jerusalem, we mourn the city of Jerusalem. It's Yefeinof, Mesos Kalaretz. It was just something beautiful. When we mourn the lost land, we mourn our sovereignty. We mourn our autonomy. We mourn the fact that we are subject to another nation's control. That's one aspect in each of those three cases. There's another way of mourning, which is deeply spiritual. It does not look at the temple merely as a beautiful, grand building. It looks at it as a place where a Jew could get closer to God, where his prayers are heard, where the, the, the ancient sacrifices were in place and inspired us to a greater level of spirituality, where one could achieve forgiveness of one's sins in a place and in a time where no other place or time can do as a place for atonement, personal change, growth, teshuva. So that's another way of looking at the lost temple. At the lost Jerusalem, instead of mourning the wonderful restaurants that once dotted all of Yerushalayim, we don't mourn just the material, the physical. We mourn the entire experience of being in Jerusalem. It was only in Jerusalem that the Korban Pesach could be eaten on Pesach. It was only in Jerusalem that Ma'atzasheni could be eaten. Jerusalem itself contained a, a certain spiritual dimension that we miss to this very day. When it comes to the land of Israel, it's not just the beautiful countryside, the hills and the valleys, the forests and the lakes. It's all beautiful. It's not just the peros Eretz Yisrael, the fruits that grow in, in Israel, the delicious dates and figs and grapes, etc. But the land itself has its kedusha, has its holiness in various ways. There are mitzvot which can only be fulfilled in Eretz Yisrael, never in Chutz Eretz, Trumos, Maisros, Shemitah, etc. So to all these three focuses of our Tisha B'Av experience, we could mourn it in one of two ways. We could mourn the physical, mundane, surface aspects of what was lost, and they're all important, and it hurts to have lost them. But that's not the desirable way, right? Right, right, Rav Levi Yitzhak. The desirable way is to miss the spiritual aspects, the mitzvah performance aspects of Beis Hamikdash, Ir Yushalayim, and Eretz Yisrael. And therefore, he says that if a person, as he says in his question, the person who is extremely pious and just meticulous in his mitzvah observance, but if he cannot appreciate the loss of the spiritual aspects of those big three, Beis Hamikdash, Ir Yushalayim, and Eretz Yisrael, then there's something lacking. There's something lacking. Ah, you're going to ask the question, but he tried his best. He did so much. He was meticulous in what he ate and didn't eat. He kept all the Shabbosos. He kept all the Chagim, etc., etc. He had beautiful tzitzis, beautiful tefillin, etc. Something must be missing. If all of that does not bring him to an appreciation of what was lost on that Tish above long ago, on the Beis HaMikdash, Ir HaKodesh, and Eretz HaKodesh. And this is what we're here for today, to try to be able to say that if at least one day this year, at least one day this year, I was misabel al Yerushalayim. I mourned for Jerusalem. I mourned for it in a spiritual sense. I felt a gap, a void, a vacuum in my own, the depths of my own soul because I couldn't connect to God through each of these three major connections, the land of Israel, the city of Yerushalayim, and the Beis HaMikdosh. This says, Rabbi Levi Yitzchak, the Kedushas Levi, is, is the message, the message of Tisha B'Av. It's, there's one day of a year where you can reach that depth of sincerity, that depth of commitment, that depth of openness to something beyond 
the material, to something purely spiritual. And that's what we search for on Tisha B'Av. We're going to do today is recite together several kinos. What I would suggest is I will usually give a prelude or introduction to each kino. What I will do, since I am free recording, I'm not doing it on Tisha B'Av day, but after each of my short talks, I will, we'll take a pause. You can take a pause. The camera will take a pause. And during that pause, we'll recite the actual text of the kinna, which we will read. Now let's take that pause right now before we begin the first kinna of the day, which I will present again momentarily. For the first kina of the day, let us begin, and as I would like to indicate, we will not be reciting together all of the kinos in the, the book, the Kinos Mesodas Horav, the OU, OU's edition of the kinos. But we will have selected kinos, and the first one we will select is to be found on page 254 in this edition. It is generally numbered as kina number nine of the morning kinos. And it begins with the words, Echo tifarti me rosai hishlichu. I'd like to give a few preliminary remarks putting the frame around this particular kina. So it begins on page 255 in the Hebrew side of the page with Echo tifarti me rosai hishlichu. How they have hurled my glorious crown from my head. Echa, how? It's a, it's a statement of shock. How could this have happened? That tifarti, my glory, my crown, mero shosai hishlichu, has been hurled. Hishlich means to throw violently, tossed aside, rejected, and stripped from my head. Ucheneget kisei hakavod. Selem himlichu. How has it come to pass that an idol has been erected in the throne of honor's stead? Instead of the kisei hakavod, the throne of God's glory, there is now an idol, I D O L, in its place. A mute, dead product of human handiwork, an idol, a statue made of clay or cement or wood or whatever, instead of God's glory. There's a reason for this. We'll, we'll try to penetrate deeper and deeper into this notion that the Mekonein is about to express now. The Kinos, by and large, go beyond the tragic event that they are describing, which is tragic at every level, to look deeper and to understand what moral failure could have led to this tragedy. And this really is the goal of a Jew in every aspect of his or her life, the ability to take responsibility for one's actions. And when things go wrong, to try to determine what was it that we did wrong that has now to be corrected. And so right here in this third line, the Mekonein, the author of this kino, asks or, or states, asher because we abrogated the conditions counseled by our prophets. Chozai, our seers, our leaders who saw, who saw our moral failures, our shortcomings, our sins, and gave us advice and guidance as to how to correct our behavior, but we were mechaleel, we abrogated, we rejected this advice. Venom in telechu. Let's not forget that he, the Almighty, said, if you follow in my statutes, if you follow my laws. So this is the First stanza. You will notice, of course, that it begins with an aleph, echa, 
It is also the beginning of the book of Epha, the Sefer of Lamentations. And then it ends with a phrase from Parshas Bechu Kosai, the last uh, chapters of the book of Sefer Vayikra, of Leviticus. And then there is the following little subscript, and it reads, Lomo Torivu Elai Kulchem. This is God's response to our complaint. We're complaining about the throne tossed off of our head, about the idols in the temple, about the fact that we rejected the good counsel of the prophets. The Rebona Shalom responds to us. He talks back to us and whispers, why do you call me to account? <laughs> Why are you blaming me? <laughs> you have spoken too harshly against me. <laughs> you have done this to yourselves. <laughs> Point of confessing one's guilt, confessing one's failures. That's God's response. The Jews' response is, Eicha, Eicha, how could this happen? And God, and it's a small print in this edition, whispers back, why are you looking at me as if it's my fault? It's your fault. And let's choose another paragraph. Bez. Bila shoftai b'mo eitzos ifsom. He devoured my judges, first distorting their judgment. The judicial system, the courts, whom we depend upon for equity, for fairness, for justice, they failed. They failed. They took bribes, etc. They were corrupt. He, God, hid his face from them, from the judges, when he beheld their wickedness. We believe that a judge who is acting properly will have God's assistance. Elohim Nitzav Ba'adas Kale. God himself will help support the judge who was a true and fair judge. But if he's a corrupt judge, you can't expect God to support and help him in his corruption. He transformed rain to dust to astonish them. One of the greatest curses that a person who lives in an agricultural society which our ancestors back in the ancient land of Israel were basically farmers. That way we were in a high-tech country then. We depended upon agriculture. Well, the worst curse that can happen to a farmer is if instead of rain coming down from the heavens, just dust comes down from the heavens. That's the type of punishment that will come from the, for this injustice, this corruption of the judicial system. Chelef v'nosati gishmechem be'itam. Starts with the base, second letter of the Aleph base, and concludes with a phrase lifted from Parshas Bechu Kosai. When you guys are doing your thing correctly, the Jewish people are behaving themselves properly, and the judicial system for the Jewish people is working without corruption, fairly, justly, then Nosati Gishmechem Beitam. I will grant you rain in its season. That's the complaint. The response of God is, Sechi umaos somani. You made me into something filthy and refuse. You rejected me. You stamped upon me. You trod upon me. Kilavi apo vayistameni. God in his anger persecuted me. Nichumov mehero yishashuni. May his consolation soon delight me. Always that hope, that hope for Nechama. This is our first mention today, not the first mention in the entire book of Kinos, of Nechama, of consolation, of comfort, of somehow getting out of this Tisha B'av state into a much happier uh, state of mind, into a much more complete lifestyle. And this is how the Kino proceeds, Aleph, Bez, Gimel, Dalad, Always, 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 not glorifying our sins, but confessing our sins openly, facing our faults, confessing our faults. And behind it all, of course, we have God's promise that he will at one point forgive us and redeem us. This is the kinah 
that we will recite together now. And I will take our pause, and you can recite this kina um, on your own. So we've recited kina number one. We'll move on to another kina now, and it is kina number 19 in the Kinos booklet, beginning on page 392, 393, and it is entitled L'cho Hashem HaTzedoka. I'd like to give a little preface to this particular kina. The previous kina, we prefaced it with a comprehensive view on the day of Tisha B'Av from the works of the author of Kedushas Levi, Rabbi Levi Yitzchak of Bardichev. I'm going to fast forward several centuries now with a preface to this particular kina, and it is from the collection of Divrei Torah of Rav Salavechik, Zecher Tzadik Livrocha, as it appears in this volume of a series published by the Orthodox Union. And this volume is entitled Sefer Shiure Horav. It is a book of the Rav, Rav Salavechik's Shiurim lessons, Al Inyone Avelus Betisha Ba'ov. And the entire subject of mourning, which I recommend to you to study, it's not for today, but also on Tisha Ba'ov, on the special aspects of Tisha B'Av that are related to the entire topic of grief and mourning. Now, Salavajik begins with a passage in the Talmud in Maseches Pesochim, Staf Nun Dalet Amid Beis, where the Gemara writes, Omar Shmuel, Ein Ta'anis Tzibor Bebovel, Elo Tisha B'Av Bilvat. There's a concept of a Ta'anis Tzibur. An entire tractate of Shas Pavli in Yerushalmi is about the concept of a Ta'anis Tzibur. When it's Tzibur, a community, an entire community, it could be a town, it could be a large city, it could be the entire Jewish people, have facing them, they're confronted with some very, very terrible, threatening catastrophe. In Ancient times, historical times, the most typical catastrophe, besides war, was the lack of rain. An agricultural society obviously needs rain. There's no rain. The community would declare a fast day, or sometimes a series of fast days. And there's much to be said about the details of how one behaves during a community fast day. Community Day of Fasting, Ta'anis Tzibur. We have this passage in the Talmud, Meseches Psochim. Shmuel says, Tisha B'av is a Ta'anis Tzibur, and it is the only Ta'anis Tzibur that one conducts even in Bavel, not necessarily in the land of Israel. Rabbi Yochanan, the Gemara says, Rabbi Yochanan objects and says that Tisha B'Av is not a Tanis Tzibur. Tanis Tzibur is one thing. It's a community response to the lack of rain. And Tisha B'Av is something altogether different. It's not in the same ballpark. It's not in the same category as a Tanis Tzibur. In what way? My love, the Nash Moshos. A Tanis Tzibur begins in the morning of that Tanis. Several weeks ago, when we fasted on the 17th day of Tammuz, we ate the full meal the night before, and only in the morning after we woke up that day, the daytime, we fasted. Tisha B'Av is like Yom Kippur. One begins the fast on the sunset of the previous day, Bein Hashmoshos. See, it's, the fast is not a, basically a 12-hour fast, it's a 24-hour fast. No, says the Gemara, lo, limlocha. Certain types of work are prohibited on certain fast days, Yom Kippur for sure. Tisha B'av is different from Atanas Tzibur because Tisha B'av starts the night before. Tisha B'av, there are different customs about what type of work one can perform and which one cannot perform. 
And we learned that the Makam Shinago Lasos Malacha Batisha Bavosin. And in Tisha Bavon is allowed to do various types of work, um, which are defined, of course, in the Talmud and in the Shulchan Aruch. But the difference is for Ne'ilah. The point is that Tisha B'av stands apart from a tiny seaboard. As we will see, there are basically three types of fast days. There are those fast days which are fast days in response to a threatening disaster, lack of rain. It's autumn and it just hasn't rained. We need 10, 12 inches of rain in the next few weeks or we're going to have a, a famine. So the community gets together and fasts, tiny seaboard. There is another type of fast, which is a response to old problems. We fast on Asar Shavasa Batamas, Sara Bateves, Tsam Gedalia, not because of any, it could be a wonderful time, prosperity and peace, etc., etc. But a thousand years ago, 1500 years ago, 1800 years ago, 2000 years ago, there was something wonderful that happened to the Jewish people and we celebrate it. Or something wonderful, something terrible happened to the Jewish people and we commemorate it. That's another, another possibility. And then, of course, there's times when we have Yom Kippur. It's not in, in mourning, not a day of mourning, it's not necessarily a, some threatening uh, catastrophe about to happen. But Yom Kippur is a time for introspection, for tshuva, for changing one's ways for the better. Shavas Halevetsa goes on to say that on the tiniest Sibur, on these community fast days, the Rambam says, Ikor kiyum tiniest Sibur hu bizo'ako tshuva. It's all about praying, repenting, etc., etc. Mitzvah saseh, lizok, ulohoriyah, bachat sosros, al kol tsoro shetova walat Sibur. You're in trouble? Pray. Change your ways. Do better. Pray. Pray communally, pray from the depths of your heart. However, when we come to the four tzomos, the first days of Shivasa Betamus, of Asara Beteves, of Tzom Gedalia, then it's different. We, we're not just fasting, praying that we be saved from some disaster, but rather, Yeshom Yomim, writes the Rambam, there are certain days we fast now not for our current difficulties but for, but for various types of sorrows, various types of difficulties, calamities that we experienced centuries ago, millennia ago. It's a whole separate category. All of that is not just because we want to keep the historical record straight and remember some terrible problem that we had many, many, many years ago. It's rather to open up our hearts, to reflect on our history so that we could change for the better today. It's a whole second category. And then, continues Rav Soloveitchik, there are times when they're both true. Because if one must experience ancient sorrows, ancient calamities, as if they were here today, as if we, were, we still remember it, it happened so long ago, but we still remember it, that gives us an impetus to change our ways for the better today. There's no, not necessarily any terrible threat today, but there once was a threat, and there once were difficult times in Jewish history. They should bring us to prayer and teshuva, especially to teshuva. To change, change for the better. That's what Tisha B'Av is all about. It's a combination of these two components. Yes, it is a day to remember, to remember, to remember, but the purpose of remembrance is not just remembrance, it's just, just for the historical uh, aspect of the day. It's in order to prompt us and direct us to change our, way, our ways. To reflect in our heart deeply on how we could change for the better. So in that sense, teshuva is an a appropriate response to Tisha B'av. It's not just about fasting to remember the past. It's about fasting to perfect oneself for the future as well. 
The question, of course, becomes, uh, we're all humans, and we sin, we make mistakes, sometimes unintentionally, sometimes very intentionally. What is a prevailing sin that we must be concerned with at this time of year on Tisha B'Av? So there's a passage in Maseches Yoma. It's a powerful passage. And it distinguishes between the first and te second temple periods. And the Talmud writes that Migdash Rishon, the first temple, the temple which was destroyed at the hands of Babylon so very long ago, was because the Jewish people were negligent and committed sins in the three areas where the most terrible sins are included in those three categories. And the Talmud speaks of three different areas of sin. One is avodazor, idolatry, worshiping alien gods, worshiping statues, worshiping wealth, worshiping grandeur, worshiping something other than God, avodazor, alien worship. That's a large category in itself. Another category is giluya royos. It's sexual misconduct, promiscuity, infidelity, etc. These are constitute a second category. And the third category is Shvichus Damim, murder, killing people who are innocent, injustice which leads to the death of someone who is innocent of crime. Shvichus Damim, spilling blood. These are the three, the quote big three. And they are the big three. These are the three areas which the Torah is most against. Almost every other type of sin has some type of justification, rationalization, and is relatively easy to, to make compensation for, to be forgiven for. But these three, Yehoreg v'yal yavo, these three are at the extreme. Those were the three sins, and the, the Gemara brings proof texts that during that time, just before the destruction of the first temple, those sins were out there. How prevalent they were, we don't know, but they were out there and they were public. Public means the community, the leadership, knew that there were people who had fallen to those, one of those three depths of sin and wrongdoing. That was the first temple. In the second temple, writes the Talmud, this is Yomo Daf Tesam at Beis, it was not three, three sins. The people were not at that level. They were sinning publicly in these extreme ways. No, they were very careful not to, to, to act morally, properly, to certainly to not to worship idols, uh, not to be guilty of adultery or idolatry. That's for sure. And certainly not murder, but they were guilty of one sin, which is shikula, which is equivalent to those three. And that is sinas chinam, vain hatred, hating people, hatefulness, seeking revenge, seeking to do in the other person, unfair competition, and doing it bechinam, doing it not necessarily, you weren't provoked to hate this person, just for whatever reason, didn't like the way he or she dressed, the way he or she spoke, or even for no reason at all, sinas chinam. And that seems to have been a pervasive sin, and I would argue something which still pervades the world at large. People hate each other for all kinds of non non nonsensical reasons, and uh, there's very little cooperation, friendship, etc. That, that sin is what brought down the second temple. So when one wants to do tshuva on Tisha B'Av, okay, today is Tisha B'Av, you'd like to, besides fasting and reciting kinos, etc., you want to do something, you want to change something about yourself. So I'm not speaking now to an audience of murderers and adulterers and idolaters. Obviously not, but you wouldn't be watching this particular presentation. I'm speaking to people who sometimes insult other people, demean other people, shame other people in ways which are really 
not justifiable at all. Sinas chinam. There's no reason for this type of hatred. And this is something to focus on. The next kina, which we will recite again, is on page, begins on page 392, on to page 393 in this particular edition. And it's entitled, L'cho Hashem HaTzedakah. This is really a confession rather than a kina. It's a lament. That's what a kina is, it's a lament. But it is also a confession, confession to God that he, the Almighty, is righteous and the faults lie within us. And one fault, the extreme fault in the time of the Second Temple, continuing to this day, is sinas chinam, vain hatred. Let's recite this together. Then we'll have a brief pause where you can recite it all on your own carefully. I just want to highlight some phrases in the keynote, which is a relatively short one. Begins, L'cho Hashem HaTzedakah. We proclaim, with you, O Lord, is the right. Tzedakah here means righteousness, not so much charity as righteousness. You're right, we are wrong. V'oso sasher hifleisa meyoz v'yadato. You were kind to us, showed us all sorts of wondrous signs, then and now. V'lanu boshe saponim. The shame is on us. V'vchino asher nitzrafnu v'yosonu ti'afto. For the trials by which you tested us, you gave us opportunities. In this example of s'china s'chinam, every day, every moment of the day, we have opportunities to smile at the other person. Ask him or her how she's doing. To compliment people for a good job. For being a happy person, easy to get along with. We have the opportunity to be that way. Or we have the opportunity to ignore other people, to insult them, to, to turn our backs upon them, etc. And you're right, we are wrong in our behavior. Just to skip down... Uh, L'cho Hashem at the end of that page, of page two, uh, 393. L'cho Hashem at you, O oh God, you're in the right. Bamidbar lo chosarnu dover. When we were in the desert, in the wilderness, we lacked nothing. We lacked nothing in the wilderness. V'lanu boshes haponim. The shame is upon us. Baniatsus lovon v'chatseros v'di zohor bamidbar. Because of the disgraceful way in which we despised the mana, we weren't grateful. Showing gratitude is a way of showing friendship. I thank you for what you've done for me. Denying gratitude is a way of hating the other person. What do you ever do for me lately? That's that's in Aschina. That's vain hatred. Rebelled along with Korach, rebelling against the leader. That's often done out of vain hatred. I don't like the way this guy speaks. I don't like the way that this politician dresses. I don't like this or that. That's vain hatred. And we sinned. We sinned with too much gold. So we made the gold into a calf. Instead of realizing that gold can be used for all sorts of wonderful, wonderful projects in life, in human life, we cast aside our gold and made it into a golden calf. We made it money, something to worship, instead of something to help other people. Instead of using fortunes to build hospitals, to build places where hungry people could be fed, instead of that, we took our money and spent it on mansions, spent it on all sorts of foolishness and all sorts of waste. And that's how this kinna continues. So recite this kinna, and I'll take a little pause, and then we'll continue with this theme uh, of sinas chinam. Now that we've read the kinah of the Cho Hashem Hatzdoko, God, you're right. We need to be ashamed. And I convey to you that Chazal point to one area of fault, of sin, that was the cause of the destruction of the Second Temple namely sinas chinam, hatred for one's fellow, rather than love for one's fellow. Instead of yohavta l'reyach ha'kamocha, 
Instead of loving one's fellow as oneself, one hates the other person and shows it in various ways. I'd like to continue to speak a bit about this horrible, horrible shortcoming which we are all prone to, namely sinatrinam, this type of hatred. And I'm going to be referring to a kina, which is not a kina. It's not a lament, not part of the traditional kinos. It's not to be found in the book that I've been drawing from until now. My assistant, Mrs. Yocheved Goldberg, has prepared for all of you a booklet which will contain an outline of everything that I've said today and will also provide some of the sources that I will quote from, which are not in the kina, which hopefully you have, in the volume that you have, or in comparable volumes. And one example of this is my next presentation, and that is a poem written not in the previous millennia, not in the previous century, but rather in our own time, by a contemporary poet who passed away now about 20 plus years ago, whose name was Aharon Mursky. And Professor Mursky was a professor at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And his area of expertise, of special scholarship, was piyut, which one would translate liturgical prayers, prayers which were written as poems, but as part of the liturgy. He himself was an expert on that area of history and had a lot to say about the history of the Kinos, for example, and the history of various Piyutim, perhaps the most famous of which is Unisana Tokev, which we recite on the Yom Imnoroyim. But he also wrote poems, poems based upon his own experience. He came pre-Holocaust from Lithuania, Poland, Eastern Europe to Palestine then and was active in the construction of the state of Israel, especially the entire field of higher education. So he wrote a book of poems, which I have before me here. The title of the book is Din Hashir, the, the justice of poetry, of song. And it's a thin book. It's poems, again, short, brief poems, clear poems, about 150 pages. And I'd like to share with you one of these poems, which you can find in your booklet at the appropriate page. Again, it is, and it will be labeled, it is labeled in English, Aaron Mursky, comma, and then transliterated Din Hashir. I'm reading you the Hebrew version which my, with my rough translation. The Hebrew version begins, this is a poem about how a wonderful childhood friendship deteriorated and deteriorated into vain hatred. People who were once the closest of friends, the best of friends, and all of a sudden they were enemies for no good reason whatsoever. And here's how the poem reads. It's entitled Tochecha. It's often pronounced or mispronounced Tochecha. It refers to those sections of the Torah which scolds the Jewish people, tells us, you know, there's a consequence for your actions, this payment or punishment for your sins. And it begins as follows, a beautiful, beautiful portrait that he pay, paints in words. Cain, bain hoyisi lemishpachas ohavim im yedidim. I was once the son, the child, of a family of friends and lovers, people who loved each other. We would eat our bread together. Whether the bread was bitter or sweet. If it was maror, with bitter times, we would still be friends, console each other, support each other in every way. And if the bread was magadim, it was delicacies, well, all the better. We were friends and we celebrated and we ate and drank together. My heart kind of took me away. My heart grabbed me with hope, tikva. 
And the hope was, La'ad nihyeh kach achudim. We would be forever so, so joined as one. This is his childhood experience and his reflection upon his childhood hopes that this beautiful family, neighborhood, community would continue on this friendly, wonderful, loving way. Lo arich sipur shel etzev. I'm not going to go on and tell you a sad story. Lo yodati ech karo. I don't know how it happened. What happened to that dream world? Ech ahava hafcha la ketzev. How did love become transformed into vicious anger? Vididim ot forever. How could people who were formerly yididim Wonderful friends, and all of a sudden they're enwrapped with wrath. All of a sudden we can't agree with each other or anything. We're arguing all the time. I don't know how it happened. It's kind of underscores, this is vain hatred developing in front of our eyes. There's no reason, but all of a sudden we're just snapping at each other, etc. Could it have been Satan himself that kind of sprinkled us, threw into our midst, Chetzef, uh, arrogance, is that what happened? Oh, how you did do toy, Or did friendship itself go out of style? It became strange. What's this friendship all about? So slowly, slowly, this wonderful, almost utopian community, family, sitting together, eating together, singing together, has become disjointed. Chodal t'yimrei I I stopped, I ceased being happy with my friend. I stopped being sad when he was sad. The beginning of the deterioration of love and to hate. My tree, he was lucky. My tree continued to blossom. But his farm, his plants, his agriculture began to become jaundiced began to fade, to decay. He was not so fortunate. When my friend began to fall low and be stooped low, he was helpless upon his own pavement. He was lying there helpless on the sidewalk. And what did I do? What did I do when my neighbor, my friend, my old friend was suffering so, and I was living just across the street from him? Chalon beisi negdos or something. I closed my window. I drew down the, the, the shutters. I closed the curtains. I, I deliberately didn't look upon his suffering. Below over ospanov. I didn't want to see his face. Notice the deterioration. Now I'm just totally ignoring him. Umimulo shuvili ikamti. From before him, I would take a detour. Instead of walking right by his house, I would go the long way around just to avoid him. Avoid, ignore. Laval tifkosh eni enov. I just wanted to be sure that my eye would not see his. If he gave me a blessing, he waved to me and said, Good morning. I stuffed my ears. I didn't want to hear it. And I denied him my personal greetings. So what happened is here, this wonderful childhood scene of everyone getting together and helping each other. Is now a situation where they're avoiding each other as much as can be. They don't want to see each other. They want nothing to do with each other. And then the climax. And I'm going to anticipate the climax a bit because the last word is la zozel. La zozel means the scapegoat on Yom Kippur. <laughs> Let them take this, this goat and throw it down, the, uh, down into the pit, down the cliff. La zozel. The best translation in English, and I dislike using the word hell, but the hell with you. Damn you. That's the ending of the poem. And here, here it comes. Hu li zoro. He became something disgusting to me. Below Essa and I couldn't bear him. I felt he was smelly in some way, physically disgusting. Ani nichbad. I am an honorable person. Who shall fail? He's a lowly person. I am a prince. Prince of industry, a prince of wisdom, a prince of success, and he is a schlepper, a bum, a vagabond. Gamzacholo Eskereno, why do we want to remember him? Oh, what's his name? I, I remember who I remember him. Yeah. Like Zacharlo Eskereno. I don't even want to remember him. 
Ain Busha, this car to fail. He has an embarrassment to remember him. Him, that guy, ah, I don't want to know about him. He was an embarrassment to me. The darkness should take him away. I don't want to know from him. Who Ben Belishem, he's now anonymous. A person without a name, he's anonymous. Lazazel, let him go, you know where. Wow. He starts off with a Yedidim, Ohavim, wonderful experience. We ate our bread together in the best of times and the worst of times. And then silence, ignoring, avoiding, and finally demeaning, dehumanizing, degrading, and finally just rejecting him with a loud curse. Lazazel. This is the end of the poem. He wrote it in uh, 1963, it works out. But it, it, it encapsulates for me the epitome of Sinas Chinam in, in beautiful 20th century poetry. This is a kina worthwhile putting into the kinos, especially after we begin to say, Lecha Hashem Stoka, Tisha B'av is a time for repentance. We all have those aspects of our personality. We all have all good friends that we gave up on long, long ago. They went their way, I went my way, and never the twain shall meet. And that's the crux of Sinas Chinam, something to remember. We just focused together on the tremendous problem, the issue at hand, which is the root cause of the predicament we are still in today. Today, mamash, at this point in time. And that is our failure to overcome the tendency of many of us of sinas chinam, of hating, reducing wonderful relationships to hatred. This is a problem the Jewish people have had at least back until the time that we sold our brother into slavery, when the brother sold Yosef Hatzadik into slavery. The beginning of a, a difficult, difficult phase of Jewish history, slavery in Egypt. Some trace this back to earlier biblical times, before Yosef the time of Cain and Hevel, two brothers, the only two people in the world besides their parents, and they couldn't get along, and one murdered the other. Sinas Chinam has pervaded human history from its very, very inception, from its very, very creation. And it persists to this day, persists among us, within families, within marriages, within communities, within societies, within nations, within the human race. Hatred, 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 war vicious competition, persecution, etc., etc. Sinas chinam, hatred for no good reason. And I share with you the poem of Aaron Mursky. How did Chazal, right, we had the Gemara, in Mitzach Yoma, the root cause of, of, of Golos, of the destruction of a second temple, was Sinas chinam. How did Chazal, what did they see in their society the time of the Second Temple, that led them to believe that the root cause of it all was hatred. People couldn't get along with each other. In, 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 in crazy ways, wage would make no sense. There's a, an entire section, three or four dapim, three or four blot, in the Seches Gitin, which g give us numerous stories actual real life events that caused, that showed, that demonstrated this type of vain hatred. And I go back with you to a passage in the Talmud on Daf Nun Hei Amid Beis, 55b. Fascinating passage. I'm going to read it to you with a minimum of commentary, just to give you the impact of this example the type of sinas chinam that destroyed, destroyed Yerushalayim. It begins with a statement of Rabbi Yochanan, near the bottom of Dafnun Hei Yomid Beis, Gitin, Meseches Gitin. Om Rav Yochanan, my dirsiv, the verse reads in Mishlei, Ashrei Odom Mefachei Tomib, Umak Libo Yipol Buro. Just translating the first half of that verse, Solomon says, 
Fortunate, happy is the man who is always afraid. Mefachet tomit. You might think this is a person who is best treated with some time of anti-anxiety medication. He's always afraid. That's not what Rabbi Yochanan means. Rabbi Yochanan means fortunate is a person who whenever something happens in life, one thinks, what can be the consequences of this? If I make a right turn here, what might then occur? What's lying ahead? A bottomless pit? And I'm going to just fall off the road to, to my death? Or a smooth highway? You always got to think things over and consider the possibilities, the realistic possibilities, not to dream up some, some, some scary figure, or some scary uh, fantasy. But rather, realistically, what, what, what might happen if I do this or if I do that? Ashrei Adam Mefachei Tomit. The examples that he gives are many. We'll only take a look at one of them. And that is simply not thinking of the consequences of snubbing another person, of putting another person down and embarrassing him. What might be the consequences? Do you think that the consequences of your slight, of your one-time friend will lead to anything disastrous? Will it lead to the destruction of Jerusalem, to the exile of Jewish people because I snubbed Plony, because I snubbed so-and-so? Could that be? You have to take it seriously. Maybe, maybe. Ashrei Odom Mefachei Tamid. Got to always be afraid of the consequences of your action. And here's the example, first example. There are many. Akamsa Ubar Kamsa Chorov Yushalayim. Jerusalem was destroyed in ancient times, Second Temple times, because of an event which occurred with two people, one named Kamsa, the other named Bar Kamsa, anonymous people. What's the story? The story is as follows. Tahu Gavra, there was this person who remains anonymous in the story who was throwing a party. We'll just call him the, the party thrower. A happy-go-lucky fellow who was having a birthday party and wanted to invite all of his best friends. However, his best friend was a man named Kamsa. Derachame Kamsa. His good friend was Kamsa. But there was a little confusion because Ubal Devove, his worst enemy, was a man named Bar Kamsa. Were Kamsa and Bar Kamsa related? Was Bar Kamsa Kamsa's son, and that's why he was called Bar Kamsa? Well, they did, did they just have you know, similar names? One's name was Smith, S-M-I-T-H, and the other was Smith, S-M-Y-T-H. People had similar names all the time. But his enemy was Bar Kamsa, let's get that straight. His friend was Kamsa. So he's about to make this big party. Those days there was not only no post office mail, but there was you know, uh, old fashioned mail, um, but there was no mail and there was no email. And there was no communication. And if you wanted to send out an invitation to all of your close friends and you happened to be a wealthy person who had a servant or, a, or some gopher, some fellow who would run errands for you, you would tell him, go and invite. My good friend comes to the party I'm making next Tuesday night. That's what he did. He said to his, uh, his, uh, his servant, Zil Kamsa, go and bring Kamsa to the party. Give him an invitation to my party. So this gopher, this young fellow, an errand boy, went to the house of a man who thought was Kamsa. He looked in the telephone book or the local neighborhood uh, calendar, and he sees under, under Kuf, yeah, there's a man named Kamsa, but there it said, Kamsa, comma, bar. So when sending, instead of inviting the good friend Kamsa, he invited the enemy, Bar Kamsa. I see lay Bar Kamsa. Okay. So Kamsa didn't come to the, to the party. He didn't know he was invited. He didn't know there was a party. But Bar Kamsa, the enemy came. Oh, maybe he's making friends with me again. Sends me an invitation to his nice party. I'm going to the party to buy a new suit and a bow tie. He comes to the party. Well, the host of the party walks into the grand ballroom. Also, 
Ashkeche, and he looks around the room, and what do you know? Who do we see? Who does he see sitting there? Bar Kamsa, his enemy. Ashkeche, the Havi Yosef, he sees his best, his worst enemy is sitting and enjoying himself at the Shmur, right? Or Malay. So the host says to Bar Kamsa, his enemy, Michte, what's going on here? Hahu Gavra, this person doesn't even call him by his name. He just says, This person, you, Baldavava Dahu Gavra, who, you're my worst enemy. What are you doing here? How'd you get here? Who invited you? My boy is What are you doing here? Come, get up, hook, get out. Whoa. That's Sinashino. Come into the party. It's your own party. You want everybody to be happy. Here's this guy, your enemy, and you pick him up and to say the least, discourteously reject him from your own home or your own grand ballroom. What's going on here? So Barkamsa responds. He says, look, quietly. I came already. I'm here. Ho'ilva soy. I'm here. Shavka, leave me alone. Don't embarrass me. I have a hundred guests here. The Paneho here, her ear, all the rabbis in town are here, all the big shots, all my old friends and everything else. So you don't want me here because I'm your enemy. You know, let, let me stay here. And you know what? In case you're worried about how much it costs you, how much I'm gonna eat, and the lamb chops and drink of the of the fine wine, I'll pay for my I'll pay for my meal. I'll pay for my meal. You have Nilach de me Madachil Navishasina. I'll pay you whatever I eat and I drink. So it'll cost you a hundred bucks. I'll give you a hundred bucks and just let me stay here. Don't embarrass me. Omale, so this uh, host seems to have a very limited vocabulary. All he can say is, get up, get out, or no. And he says to him now, no, lo. Omale, yehivneloch de me palgo de sudasech. I'll give you a deal. You know, this is a hundred person party in the grand ballroom with all this delicious food and expensive wine. I'll pay you the cost of half of the meal. The meal has like, to cost you maybe 20 grand. I'll give you 10 grand. Just let me stay here. Don't embarrass me. You have no love to make pal good as soon as So, what does the host respond? Again, one word low. No, that's all. Omale, so he says to him, You're upping the ante, huh? You have no love to make cool as soon as Cost you twenty thousand dollars a whole affair. I'll pay you the whole twenty thousand. <coughs> I'll pay for the entire affair. Just let me stay here. Don't embarrass me. Again, he says low, no. And now he says, besides his limited vocabulary of get up, get out, or no, now he gets uh, physical. Nakte biyode. He takes Barkamsa in his hands. He grasps him by his collar. Vukme, and he picks him up. Afke, and he throws him out. So now, that's the end of that story. This guy's thrown out. Barcomte is now out in the street. He hopefully landed on his feet. And he's rejected and insulted and embarrassed and shamed. All because of Sinasrino. The host didn't like him. He had a grudge, threw him out. He offered to pay for the meal, for half the meal, for the whole affair. No, 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 picked him up and threw him out. That's the scene. That's a, a picture, a photograph of sinasrinam, hatred for no reason. So what does Barkamsa do? Well, if you reward a person, act toward a person with cruelty and disdain and anger, his response will be cruelty, disdain, and anger. Only natural. We are in life and our interpersonal relationships like a person in front of a reflecting pool. If I scowl at the reflecting pool at the mirror, the pool scowls at me. If I smile at the reflecting pool, the pool smiles back at me. You rejected and embarrassed and insulted and in some way harmed by Kamsa. Barkamsa will get back at you in the most vicious way he can imagine. And that's what happens. Barkamsa says to himself, sitting there on the floor, having been thrown out, he says, you know, besides this host who, anyway, he's a lousy person, he hates me, etc., he threw me out, he's bad enough. But you know who I'm really angry at? 
the rabbis in town, the biggest rabbis in town were guests at this dinner, at this party. And they're sitting around and they watch the whole scene of me being tossed out into the street by this host. I'm angry at the rabbis. Why didn't they protest? Why didn't they stick up for me? Why didn't they come over to the host and say, hey, cool it, take it easy. Let the guy stay here, it's okay. No, they didn't do that. So he saw the, the Rabbono and the rabbis were sitting there, and they didn't protest. You see, they're okay. They're okay with sinasrinam. When they see strife and discord and arguments and hatred going back and forth within the community, within the family, within the friends, they don't try to stop it. They don't say enough of this nonsense already. Let's cool it and get along with each other. They don't say that. The leadership of the community, they're responsible. And if that's the case, Ezel, Echel, Be Kurza, Be Malka. Remember, we're living under the Roman rule. I'm going to go to the Roman Caesar or the Roman ambassador, or whoever's in charge of Judea at that time, whichever Roman general or politician or governor is acting for them, and I'll go and slander the Jewish people and tell him that the Jewish people are rebelling against him, and then they'll put down a hard fist and they'll send some of these guys to jail and some of these guys to the gallows, maybe all of us into exile, and I don't give a darn. Let that happen. And that's what he does. And there's more to the story, but of course it all ends with the destruction of Yerushalayim. And Rabbi Yochanan is telling us, 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 Ashrei Adam Afachei When you mistreat a person, think of what the consequences might be. It might go from pillar to post, from better to worse to worse to still worse to the worst, to the Churban of Yerushalayim. This is the Gemara itself telling a story which could have easily led and did eventually lead to the destruction of Yerushalayim. The question, of course, becomes, and this is crucial, okay, so there's sinas chinam out there in the world, there's hatred. What's the opposite of it? So one of Chavi's, my wife's ancestors, was a Hasidic Rebbe named Rabbi Yecheskel of Kuzmir. I think he was the first on record to say and to write that the cure for sinas chinam, the cure for hatred for no darn reason, for no good reason, is the, the opposite of that is ahavas chinam, loving a person for no special reason, liking the other guy not because he did you a favor, not because you expect something back from him. You're a nice guy, you're okay, you know, I like you, that's all. Avas chinam, avas chinam. That's the reverse. And if we act in a manner toward each other, avas chinam, there's no special reason why I should like you. You're a nice fellow, you're a member of this family, you're a member of the Jewish people, you're another good human being, whatever it is, I like you. That's the way it should be, avas chinam. And that's gonna reverse in as chinam. That distinction is credited to many people who live subsequent to Cheskel and Kuzme. It's attributed to Rav Kook. From knowing Rav Kook's lifestyle, that was his uh, MO also. That's the way he behaved. He loved people even if they were his enemies. And they tried to do him in and hung posters in the street against one of his policies or whatever. Not only did he forgive them, but he loved them and did favors for them. That's, that's the goal, to transmute, to transform Sinas chinam, hatred for no special reason, to ava for no special reason. How does one do that? So I'd like to mention to you as a handbook, <laughs> if that's what you want to do. You want to make a resolve today, Tisha B'Av, the resolutions don't have to be on New Year's Day, on Rosh Hashanah, they can be on Tisha B'Av. Make a resolution to try to avoid sinas chinam, and really move ahead on Ahava Srinam, and you want a good handbook for it. Well, one good handbook was written many centuries ago by a man whose name was, was Rabbi Moshe Cordoviro. And he wrote about God's wonderful generosities and blessings, and about how human beings can not only emulate, but can, um, so to speak, inspire God to respond in a loving way by acting lovingly, by acting with chesed, with acting with generosity, acting with friendship, acting with a smile. One can, in a sense, install those midos in Kaviyochel, God himself, 
so that he becomes full of blessing and grace and succor. The name of his sefer, Rabbi Moshe Cordoviro, is Tomer Devora, the palm tree of Devora. And in and of itself, it's a wonderful handbook for how to be better at being good, how to improve in being loving and kind. Some time ago, I picked up a kind of a commentary on Torah, Tomer Devora, written by a contemporary. It's a two-volume work. Here's a picture of the cover of the first volume, Tomer Devora by Rabbi Moshe Cordoviro, a Kabbalist in the 16th century, 15th century. And, but this uh, commentary is like an expansion of the book Tomer Devora. So this is not written centuries ago, this is written yesterday. By a, it's called Bisafa Barura in, in a clear language. And it tries to bring down various ethical situations, social situations, which are clumsy and awkward and difficult and might easily lead to misunderstanding and to enmity and to turn them into opportunities for friendship. And it's written as if it was written for a grade school student. It's written with the Kudot, etc. in Ivrit. Fascinating. But he, in one of the midos, one of the God's qualities which we are supposed to emulate, according to the author of Tomer Devora, Tomer Devora Rabbi Moshe Kodaviro, is called Kichofetz Chesed Hu. God wants Chesed. And he defines Chesed not as being generosity or loving kindness, etc., but Chesed is bestowing upon another person undeserved friendship. The person is not necessarily a friend of yours. You just met him for the first time and he could go his way and you can go your way, but you give him chesed. You give him grace. That's God's way and that could become the way for each of us. So he quotes in support of this no less than three different midrashim, three different uh, texts in the medrash. Uh, one in Medrash Rabbah Parshas Vayikra, and one in Masechah Sanhedrin and Perik Chelek, and uh, uh, another in Echo Rabbah uh, Parsha Dalin. But in all of them, you see the way that in various times in history the Jewish people are doomed, and the Malach Horah, the evil angels, the demons are doing all sorts of things and kind of gleefully waiting for the time when they can strike. And then as one kind angel comes along and says one kind word, another kind word, etc., and turns everything around again, turns everything around again, and converts uh, almost magically the sinas chinam, the hatred of the opponent, of the ministering angel who's, who's the, the, the persecuting angel, the prosecuting angel, and silences him and gets, so to speak, on God's good side to have the midah tova, the Chofetz Chesed Hu aspects of God and bring them alive. I recommend this book to you really as a handbook, especially in this volume, this um, edition, um, which is available through Machon Simanim uh, of Yerushalayim. And if you're interested, you can contact me and I'll give you the details of how to get it. But it's a textbook in, in my language, uh, in the Cheskel Kuzma's language, of changing, magically almost, changing Sinas chinam, hatred, discord, can't get along into avas chinam. It's a, it's a book of, you know, you can do self-therapy through the use of this excellent sefer. We'll stop here for a moment and then we'll move ahead, actually move ahead historically as well as in other ways. So far, in looking at Tisha B'Av, that's a day of mourning, fasting, sorrow, and focusing on the core of the historical aspects of the day. Focusing on the Beis Hamikdash, the city of Yerushalayim, the exile from the land. Now we have to move ahead in time because the requirements of Tisha B'Av and the lessons of Tisha B'Av 
ring true throughout Jewish history. And with our first kino, we focused on the ancient catastrophes, which were certainly numerous and very, very tragic and painful. We look beyond that to our own responsibilities, to what our prophets and our sages, the Vim, the Chazal, saw as the root cause which we must work on beyond mourning, and that is self-correction, self-improvement, in a word, teshuva. And to do that, we have to uncover the f- focal sin of our people. From the beginning of history, as I suggested, from Yosef HaTzadik of our history, right down to this very day, mamash. If we fast forward from the exile after the second temple was destroyed, we can move ahead into various issues across the centuries. I want to focus on one right now at this moment. And to do so, I just want to quote a sentence or two from a book by a gentleman named Edward H. Flannery. Flannery himself was a Roman Catholic priest. In 1964, he published this book. I have in front of me the revised and updated edition of this book, which, according to the blurb on the back cover, was hailed by Christians and Jews alike as a groundbreaking book that did much to expose the fact of historical anti-Semitism in the United States and around the world. In the words of a Jewish leader, this is a major contribution to Jewish-Christian relations. In the words of a leader of the Roman Catholic Church, He thinks or thought that it will bring the Catholic community an entirely new development in their thinking about the people of the Jewish faith. For each of us as individuals, this book is extremely valuable for whatever lessons one can draw from it, which are many and powerful. And that is the anti-Semitism which we, the Jewish people, experienced, especially in the continent of Europe, but as in the revised version of the book, it updates it to current times and to the United States as well. In chapter five of this book, which which is entitled The Veil of Tears, the author writes, to find a year more fateful in the history of Judaism than the year 1096, 1096, would necessitate going back a thousand years to the fall of Jerusalem or forward to the genocide of Hitler. Though often surpassed by other years in the volume of atrocities, 1096 marks the beginning of a harassment of the Jews that in duration and intensity was unique in Jewish history. It was the year of the First Crusade. To the Jew, it was a thundercap, thunderclap out of the blue. Great ill-organized hordes of nobles, knights, monks, and peasants God wills it on their lips as they set off to free the Holy Land from the Muslim infidel, suddenly turned on the Jews. I'd like to go back with you to 1096 and for almost two centuries after that to focus on some of the history, some of the theology, some of the suffering that we must somehow absorb 
at least on this one day of the year, Tisha B'Av, when we look back and we're omitting a thousand years of Jewish history. We're going from the Second Temple to the First Crusades. The First Crusade was only, as the name implies, the First Crusade. As hordes, as the author writes, marched, Christians marched throughout Europe, through Central Europe, the various Jewish communities in the Rhineland, the center, the heart of Germany, down to, the, to Palestine, which was then occupied mainly by Muslims who were seen by the Christians as infidels. And there, of course, they met with resistance and understandable resistance by the Muslim residents against the Christian invaders. But in the mix of all that, on their way marching through Europe and in the way crossing over Palestine, entering Jerusalem, etc., they encountered many, many Jews and Jewish communities on their path and decimated those communities. This is just one book, so many books written about this and similar topics. There's another one I'd like to recommend to you by a man named Robert Chazan, or Chazan, C-H-A-Z-A-N, entitled In the Year 1096, whereas Flannery focuses upon centuries of anti-Semitism and centuries of Catholic-Jewish confrontation and relationship with one another. Chazin or Chazan focuses just on that, that time period, 1096, the end of the 11th century, and the Crusades themselves. There's much to say about it, and of course we can't go into all of it here, but just from the point of view of, let's, me- let's remember this, that's what Tisha B'Av is all about, let me just quote from one page, it's page 36 in the book, where he refers a certain person, Count Emiko, E-M-I-C-H-O, and he writes, although Count Emiko's troops had by now killed the majority of Mainz, M, capital M-A-I-N-Z, that's Mayans, that's a, was a, a thriving and large and important Jewish community. So if they had, they killed the majority of them. Isolated pockets remained. Those two were hunted down relentlessly. Now the entire literature written by Jews who survived these various atrocities and wrote about them. So we have first person accounts of various aspects of all of European history, even going back into the 11th century. And there's a quotation from one of these books. It was written by a survivor of this last uh, kind of, uh, how does he put it? Hunted, hunted, last of the hunted down, uh, the relentless uh, hunt against the the few remaining individuals of the Jewish community of Mayans. He writes, the crusaders and burghers, that means the people who lived in the burg, B-U-R-G-H, in the, in the village, turned from there and came to the center of the city, to a certain courtyard. There was hidden David, the Gabai, ben Rabnatanel, he, his wife, his children, and all the members of his household, in the courtyard of a certain priest, Many of the priests of the Roman Catholic Church were horrified by what was happening in the Crusades and did try to protect the Jewish victims. But the priest said to him, to this Nasa, this David the Gabbai, Behold, there remains in the courtyard of the archbishop and in the courtyard of his burgrave neither a remnant nor a residue. They have all been killed, cast out, and trampled in the streets. 
with the exception of a few whom they baptized. Do likewise, and you will be able to be saved, you and your wealth and all the members of your household from the hands of the Crusaders. So here you have a small remnant of Jewish people. Their leader was this David, the Gabbai. He's being offered a, a deal. Convert, allow yourselves to be baptized, and you have my guarantee you will be spared. The God-fearing man, David, replied, Indeed, go to the crusaders and tell them to come to me. When the priest heard the words of David the Gabbai, he was very happy over his words, for he thought, this distinguished Jew has agreed to heed us. He ran to meet them and told them the words of the saintly one. They likewise were very happy. They gathered around the house by the thousands and the ten thousands. When the saintly one saw them, he trusted in his creator and called to them, saying, Lo, you are the children of lust. You believe in one who was born of lust, but I believe in the God who lives forever, who dwells in the highest heaven. In him have I trusted to this day to the point of death. If you kill me, my soul will repose in paradise, in the light of life. But you will descend to the nethermost pit, the Be'er Shachat, to everlasting abhorrence to hell, where you will be judged along with your deity, who was a child of lust and was crucified. So he rejected the offer of becoming baptized, he and his small group, and Stavid the Gabbai. And he spoke out not only courageously in refusal, but tremendously courageously, and of course, at at the risk of his, uh, the certain, not the risk, but the certainty of his imminent death, and went to the core of the Catholic, Roman Catholic Church's belief in a human being who was God versus the Jewish belief in a God who was not a human being. And the passage continues. When they, the group, heard the pious one, heard this Yorei Shamayim, this David the Gabbai, when the crowd around them, the crowd of crusaders, heard this, they were enraged. They raised their standards, their flags, and camped about the house and began to call and shout in the name of the crucified. They assaulted him and killed him and his wife and his children and his son-in-law and all the members of his household and his maidservant. All were killed for Kiddush Hashem, sanctification of the divine name. They fell, there fell the saintly one and the members of his household. This is just one account by one writer scribbling in a notebook under these conditions about what he or she saw on that one day of the entire experience, what we call the First Crusade. There's one brief passage from Hassan's book. You can go on with this. Just want to mention another book which goes way beyond the Crusades. It comes with various titles, but this title that, uh, of the copy that I have in front of me is kind of my original exposure to this entire issue of Christian-Jewish relations over 1900 years. It's written by a man named Malcolm Hay, and the preface by Walter Kaufman, who was once a quite famous professor, and I was privileged to hear lectures from him in Brooklyn College long, long ago, early 1960s. But the title of the book is Europe and the Jews, The Pressure of Christendom Over 1900 Years. I'm not sure that this particular audience knows about my own experience with uh, Christianity, with the head of the Christian church, with Pope Benedict, who passed away in the past year, in the past several months. This is the Pope in exile, or the Pope Emeritus, the Pope who kind of resigned and, uh, because of his own reasons, um, and who visited the United States of America in the year 2008. 
um, just before Pesach, just before Passover of that year. And I was chosen as a, a leader in the Jewish community. I was then the executive vice president of the Orthodox Union to represent um, American Jewry. Uh, and it, this was during the George Bush's administration. Uh, actually, we met first the Pope and I uh, in the Rose Garden in Washington, D.C., in the seat of the president of the United States, and um, who referred to me in the Pope's presence as this is Rabbi Weinreb, he's my Orthodox rabbi. And uh, then later that same evening was again just before Pesach 2008, April 2008, to Catholic University, which is a Catholic university in Washington, D.C., where I was given the audience of the Pope. We met for about five minutes, and where he expressed to me his own regret and for the whole history that's described here, and felt that we had come a long way in improving relations between Christians and Jews, specifically between Roman Catholic and Jews. And uh, I had that audience, and it's something uh, to me personally a very important memory. But the history is there, and on Tisha B'Av we're here to remember that history, and hopefully we're past uh, those, that aspect of the difficulties that we face in exile. I'd like to, if we take a very brief a break, uh, go on to our next kino. Now there are several, as I count them, actually five kinos that relate not only to the Crusades, but to the entire what uh, Malcolm Hay refers to as the pressure of Christendom over 1900 years. And it is in um, this collection of kinos, uh, kino number 33, it begins on page 533, and it's entitled, Avel Aorer, I will arouse, I will stimulate grief. Poetically, it's a very interesting, different type of poem. I can um, say a few words about that when we uh, regroup. Uh, but you'll notice when you go through it, it refers to something which might just look like a code word to you. It writes about Shnas Tov Tov Nun Vav, the year Tatnu. What does that mean, Tatnu? Tatnu, uh, 896, is, corresponds, is, is in the Hebrew calendar, corresponds to the year 1096, the year of the First Crusade. So we'll turn to that kino uh, after this brief pause. We will turn now to the kino I just mentioned as one sample of, of many, many kinos that were written about this experience. Let's call it the, instead of the Christian experience, the European experience of the Jewish people who, a great number of them, of course, lived in Europe in all these centuries. The poem, the kino, as you can see just in the layout on the page, if you have the way the, the, it's, it's uh, arranged in this particular uh, uh, edition of kinos, it's kind of full of phrases of two or three words, it's like a telegram of some sort. Uh, it doesn't s s uh, flow smoothly as a poem might. And I think it's kind of uh, uh, the poetry of sobbing, the poetry of gasping. It's not the, the poetry is not, poetically, it's not fluent. It doesn't flow because certainly the history of the Jewish people in Christian Europe did not flow easily it was spurts. There were good times and bad times and good times and bad times. And it comes through in the poetry of, the, of this particular kino. Um, the, the preface in the note, um, many of which were written not by me, I did the translation, but the preface of most of them was written by a man named Rabbi David uh, Fuchs, uh, really a very fascinating Israeli scholar. But he get, introduces the kinnah. Um, uh, it shows a, a combination of styles. Each stanza is divided into two internally rhyming, rhyming lines with alternating refrains. However, the lines themselves are not identical in form. The first line of each stanza has two sides, two, two stitches, two, two phrases, while the second has three. 
the uh, alphabetic acrostic is followed by Anochi uh, Menachem He'aluv Rabbi Machir. I am Menachem, the lowly, lowly, aluv, the, the low, the humble person, the son of Rabbi Machir, identifying the author as a member of the aristocratic B'nai Machir family. But this is a medieval Jewish uh, member of a, a famous family, then famous family, and here's how he begins. Evel Aorer Aninut Agarer. That's the, the two rhyming stitches, the two rhyming phrases. I will arouse grief. I will continue in mourning. Oh, Yali. All right. Woe is me. That's like two phrases, two two word phrases, and then one two word gasp. Oh, woe is me. Befchi Amorer, Bachamas Sorer. Drochai Sorer. That's three po- uh, rhyming two word phrases. I will weep bitterly because of the wrathful foe who has strewn my path with thorns. So that's the three line or three st- phrases of rhyme. Bifchi Amorer. I will deep weep bitterly. Amorer, Maror, weep bitterly. Bechamas Tzorer, at the wrath of the enemy. Chema is wrath, Tzorer is the enemy. Dorochai Tzorer, Dorochai, my path is Tzorer, is full of thorns. And then you have that gasp, that two-word gasp. Ailalaili, oh, woe is me, wail for me. Galut, and then again the two, fra- the two rhyming phrases, each of two words each. Golut Orach, he has extended my exile. Velibi Herach, he has weakened my heart. Oy, oyoli, woe is me. Then the three verses rhyming. Dorach Uforach, he has tread and crushed. Forach from the word Perech, Avodas Perech, to be crushed. Nochani Nach Shrach, he has driven me to Edom and roasted his prey. Vitsedo Chorach, he's roasted his prey. He's consumed me. He's led me away to a foreign land. And he's consumed me there. Again, the gasping two words, I, Alalali, wail, wail for me. Hama'at Mavishi, did my enemies do but a little? Hama'at Mavishi, is that all they did was a little bit to me? No, they destroyed my holy temple. Ay, 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 woe is me. Behem bazu kotshai, they plundered my sacred objects. Hey, chelu mikdoshai, they began with the sanctuary, they began with the base of mikdosh. Vizilzalu kedoshai, and they humiliated my kedoshim, my holy people. Ay, alalaili. Until now, he could be talking about the Chorban Beis Amigdosh. That's the connection between the previous kinos. There's no mention here of Europe, no mention of Christianity. There's a hint of it when he says, Nochani Nachshirach, which is a, a way of expressing Edom, and Edom in, in, um, in Jewish tradition is, sim- is a synonym for Rome. Edom is Rome. So until now, it's, it's written very, very powerfully, woe and wail, etc., with poetic power, but we don't know when. When was this? And now comes the transition. Zaman Shnat Tatnu. It was the year, works out to be in the Hebrew calendar, the year 4856. We're now in the year of 5783. So in the year 4856, which rubs out to be 1096 Christian era, 1096 CE, but not only the year, but Biyur Aleph Lamachzor Renu, in the 11th year of the 256th cycle. Look in Rabbi Salavechik's commentary for more detail about exactly uh, when that was. Oyoli, woe is me. And then the transition becomes from the destruction of the Beis Amigdash, of holy objects, etc., it becomes a destruction of people and the conflict of Roman Catholicism and Judaism 
comes to the fore, the conflict, the theological conflict. It's not just a military conflict of a persecutor and a victim, it's the ideological, theological conflict behind, the concept of, of God and the concept of religion, Torah, mitzvot, etc. the differences which un were the underlay, the, 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 the frame for all of the suffering. As he continues, chayalot zinu, all right, they armed their hordes. Um, pinu, the crusaders left their homes. They left their homes to go marching toward the land, the Holy Land. Uh, nimnu, they were numbered like locusts. Uh, we were overwhelmed by thousands and thousands of them. Alalayli, wail for me. Taus bikshu, they searched. What, what? They searched for taus. Taus means an error meaning their error is their religion, their error is their belief system, their faith. In other words, our difference with them is based on, 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 on our different definitions of religious faith. Taos bikshu, they search for something mistaken, in our opinion. V'uli hikshu, and they made my yoke heavy, meaning they said the Jewish way is too difficult. There's day of total rest. We can't do that. We can celebrate a Sabbath, but not the way you do. We can celebrate a Passover, but not the way you do. We can celebrate in all sorts of ways, but your way is difficult for us. The way of the Jewish people is too difficult. In Yiddish they say, it's difficult to be a Jew. Rav Moshe Feinstein would say, it's not difficult to be a Jew. It's sweet to be a Jew. But we're accused of having a religion that's a burden. 613 commandments, etc. Oyoli, woe is me. Yirasam kishkishu, they rattled their religious objects. In other words, they took various religious objects that a Catholic person would use and rattle them uh, in various ways uh, and, um, and tap their crucifixes. They're constantly touching their crosses and crossing themselves. And that's not our way. But they charged me with false faith, right? O.C. Ikshu, they made me look like I am dumb and stupid. I don't have these uh, crucifixes and rosaries, etc. Kofer um, Ma'osu, they uh, rejected ransom. I wanted to pay and tell them, leave us alone. Don't force us to convert to your religion. It will pay you just to leave us alone. But they wanted our souls. Nefashos Chamsu, Oyoli. So in this kino, you see that the author... Uh, who we now know by name, was Menachem, the son of Rabbi Mochir, uh, he saw that at the root of this was not just, quote, anti-Semitism, it was not just, quote, hatred or enmity or a battle between enemies, etc. It was a theological battle. They wanted our souls. And of course, we would not give that to them. And of course, the poem goes on, but um, concludes uh, on a bit of a hopeful note, if you look toward the end on page 537 in the Hebrew, Mekayim Habris, he who keeps the covenant, God, the God of Israel who keeps the covenant, Lulei uh, Hosir She'eris, now we were, uh, the, the Jewish community of Mayans was decimated, we just saw evidence of that, but there was a remnant left, the Gei Nochris, there was a remnant next in, in the diaspora. And notice what diaspora here is not just uh, the Galut, which means diaspora, but the gay nochris in this deep diaspora, in this this pit, this valley, deep valley, and it continues kishor sha'aruris when he observed, God observed the horrible plight of his Jewish beloved yedidat ivrit, when he saw the plight of the Jewish people, he showed compassion rachamom. Mehachris, he showed compassion so that we not be destroyed, that we not be annihilated. And there is now hope for the future. You notice that hopeful note, which I hope to return to a leader, little later on this, um, uh, this presentation, that when no matter how bleak things seem, and this entire kina is as bleak as you can get, people being burned at the stake, killed, their families killed, etc., all because they would not uh, give up their religion, give up their faith. But the remnant that's spared, and we who are here alive today are all that remnant, 
Yesh tikva va'acharis. There is hope. And we'll expand upon the nature of that hope um, in a short while. Once again, we will pause. I've given the, as a title, this entire presentation, this Tish above, Tav Shin Pei Gimel, 2023. The title, Haunted History and Horizons of Hope. As we take a look at the thousands of years of Jewish history, many of those years are haunted, haunted with very, very terrible memories, memories of slavery, memories of persecution, memories of destruction, memories of Holocaust. But we also have horizons of hope as we just saw in the concluding words of this kina devoted to the First Crusade with all of its horrors, nevertheless it ends on a note of tikva, of hope. This particular year, the year that's coming to an end, the Jewish year 5783, had its share of haunted history and already has had some horizons of hope, some which we're aware of, some which we may not yet be aware of, and many which are hopefully in the immediate future, hope. I'd like to begin by looking back at this year in terms of some of those who have passed away during this past year in recent months who are themselves individuals who were beacons of hope, but who are no longer with us. What we do have with us today are two of my colleagues in the Orthodox Union, both of whom who are based in the land of Israel and Eretz Yisrael, and who are active in the OU leadership internationally. I speak of my good friend, and colleague, Rabbi Avi Berman, who is the Director General of OU Israel and a leader in every respect in his own right, and Rabbi Ezra Friedman, who is a leader in the world of Kashrus, who works for the OU Kashrus Division in Israel both of whom are great Talmidei Chachamim and who are great Talmidim, students, disciples of two individuals, and they will engage in a conversation between themselves, between Rabbi Ezra Friedman and Rabbi Avi Berman, about two of their mentors. And I refer to Rabbi Chaim Druckmann, and Rabbi Shalom Gold, both Alehem HaShalom, who have passed away recently. I look forward now to hearing Rabbis Berman and Friedman in dialogue and conversation about two Gedola Yisrael, two great men of Israel who have recently left us for Olam Haba. You sit down on Tish above. and because it's really very little to do besides think of the moments of sadness that we have in our lives on Tisha B'Av. I find myself every Tisha B'Av thinking about the gedolim that we lost this past year. And unfortunately, we've lost way too many. Giants, but there are two that come to me and to you as father figures, as people that, and I'm purposely saying people because they, they were giants. They had a vision uh, uh, of every Jew out there. 
There wasn't a Jew in the world they didn't care about. There wasn't a, uh, an element of Klai Yisrael that they didn't think of. But they saw us as people. They saw us as children. They saw us as sons. They saw us as Talmudim. And to a certain degree, I sit to Shabbat and I say to myself, how am I going to take how am I going to take from what they gave me? And I'm sure you're doing the same thing, that we're going to be able to pass on to the next generation, to our children, to our students. Not that in any way, shape, or form I could ever fit in their shoes. Probably not even their toenail. But I think of Rav Jukman, of Chaim Jukman. Zechir Tzadik Pivachat, so hard to say. Still so hard to say. Still so hard to say. And uh, Rav Shalom Gold, who literally just passed away a couple of weeks ago. Two personalities that, even if you went two years without seeing them, You walked into Rav Jukman's house. You walked into the yeshiva and saw him. He, he lit up. Ah, he lit up. And you knew that you were bringing him endless simcha. That you were bringing him nachas. Just nachas because of, because of the Torah that he taught you and what he saw that you're doing in your life. I had this chutz of having him as Rosh Hashiva when I learned in Eretz Yom for four years. And I sat literally right across from him in Dhamma. And I got this hero of Jukhan there every single morning, sitting in Dhamma, going to his house and in Yeshiva for Shirim, hearing him chazen on Musaf and Yom Kippur. Oh, wow. The, the, like you hear, you hear it in your ears. The the wall shaking. Right. Every day, Berkas Kohanim. Right. You hear the Am Kedoshecha Kamu after they declare Kohanim. And and you feel you feel that 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 power, that excitement, that 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 passion. That draws you in that shows you that Torah is not just, just a, a book that we have to follow, but it's a book that is full of, that every single word in it is something that, that, that connects to us in, in, in the deepest way possible. It's absolutely true. I, um, I connect so much with what you said, Ravavi. You know, Rav Drukman, there's so many facets of him, so many facets of personality, whether his his family, his Torah, his education, his activism, his, his, his love of Eretz Yisrael, his love of Jews around the world. I think, first of all, to understand the individual of a person whose literally every breath was for other people. The, the hours and night. You have the story, I'm sure you remember, where, where he called you and said, let's meet at 1.30, and, and you, you stood up after Mincha, no, right? I, I came over to me after Shachras, and I said, Kodera, when could I speak to you? Uh, he said, come at 1.30. Right? And that made sense to me because one o'clock was lunch, so we had a break till two. So I went to his house at one thirty and I'm waiting for him. And there's nobody there and I'm knocking. Okay, so I went back to Yeshua. The next morning he sees me after Shachars. And he says, Avi, why didn't you come? I said, Rabbi, I, I, I was there, I knocked. I came right after lunch. He said, what do you mean after lunch? Oh, I'm sorry, I told you 1.30, I, th I, I thought it was clear that it's 1.30 in the morning. <laughs> like, <laughs> it was so obvious to him. Like, it, it was push it. Like, I finished my day, you want to tell the Gamu, I'll, I'll make all the time in the world for you. So, and this is Sh Shachar at 6.30 in the morning. He's, he's still having meetings at 1.30 in the morning. It, it, it's push it. It was like, to go to him at 4 o'clock in the morning and see that he was dedicated to others, whether it be to the education of people, whether it be to Torah, whether it be to yeshiva, to education, to Israeli issues. You know, you know the, the complete dedication is, is awe. He would, you know, when he was in other, he would run to places. 
when he spoke to you, every word, it, it broke into your heart. What, nothing he said was, he meant every word he said. And I just want to add something, Rabbi Avi. And you said, walking into a drukken, Vim Josh. Walking into a drukken into, into, into his house. I felt that what we lost is I felt that anything happening in Klal Yisrael, any, any issue, any obstacle, it was on his shoulders. I felt like we had somebody to lean on. And I, and I say to myself, where did that come from? You know, I came from, from Canada when I was 17 to Israel. I met Rav Drukman, I'll never forget it. It was Rosh Chodesh Elul. It was right after Davin Ehi, Davin Yeshiva. And I was introduced to him. And the smile, that smile just grabbed me. You know, the long white beard. And, and I was, wow. You know, and we spoke. And he was able to connect to me, even though you know, his past, what he happened with, with the Holocaust, and all he did, his ability to relate to people, no matter what background, was unbelievable. What is, where does it come from, I think? Rodrigo was in America in the 50s. He founded... Shaliyah. He founded Bnei Akiva. He took a boat, whether it be Chicago, New York, in Toronto, Montreal. He did it, and Jews came to Israel, at, you know, families drinking with, with thirst, his words. I, I think his dedication to Torah, to Yiddishkeit, to Vodot Hashem, expressed itself to everything. When he met somebody, he saw Vodat Hashem. When he saw a child in education, he saw Vodat Hashem. When he saw an issue in the Knesset, he saw Vodat Hashem. That full, all-encompassing understanding of Hashem in Torah, every word in Torah, like you said, is what personified Rav Drukman. And that was his success. And maybe what we have to realize as individuals, as educators, as people, the Bit Midrash has to face everything, has to take it with us, whether it be with our children, with our friends, with, with our nation, with our people. I think that's something that we have to take from him. You know, my kid, my son, in fifth grade, came home about a year ago, um, and they were learning in school the song of Titena Charit Lanecha. Right? It's a song that is pretty much sang at every single Israeli wedding. And uh, I've seen it already at a couple weddings in America as well. A song that, that literally is coming, the words from Mosef Yom Kippur. And Rav Drukhan was such a person of Emes. And he wasn't able... He literally wasn't able to say a lie. Okay? And he had a karas atov. So he took the words of Titena Chalit Lanecha and he made a number of changes. I, pr I printed them out. Oh. I actually printed them out because, you know, a couple lines here inside the Titena Chalit Lanecha, right? Tidrosh Giulala Delegalateinu. Right, demand uh, uh, redemption, redemption to our Gulf, right? And he said, "Listen, we, we, we can't we can't come and say that we're we're still in the depth of Gulf, but we have to have a karsato for what we already have. Mitzat Sheni, we still want the Giula to come." So he changes the word "minigalutenu" to "lishvutenu" to us returning to the land of Israel, right? Or "tiferet yeshva badad," right? Instead of Tiferet Yoshevet Badad, right? Uh, Tiferet, the glory is sitting alone. Yerushalayim is sitting alone. He said, it's sat alone. Because Baruch Hashem, we can't, we can't have 900,000 residents of, Israel, of Yerushalayim, of which 700,000 are Jews, and still say Yerushalayim is sitting alone. Okay. It's not sitting alone. And, 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 it, and it brought us, a, a, it, brought a, it brought relevance to the kids. So I see my kid coming home, right? Talking about the changes Rav Drukman made to Titena Charit Lamecha. And you say to yourself, you know something? He understood a kid in fifth grade. He understood that a kid in fifth grade is having a rough time saying Yerushalayim is empty. He understands that a kid that's growing up in fifth grade in Israel is seeing soldiers, is seeing an IDF, he's seeing from guys walking all, all, all over Israel, right? 
girls with long skirts and women lighting candles and people putting on tefillin and, and, and shuls full and the kotel with minyan until, until every hour of the day and shtiblach in every city. And like, how can we come and say, Yeshevet Badad, sitting alone? The En Yoshev. That's it. You have a Yoshev, right? right? And I think that, that 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 really, if I have to look at Erev Jokon and say, what 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 did I get from him, right? Was a sense of optimism. It was a sense of seriousness of Torah, right? You walked into his library, okay? Oh wow! <laughs> the amount of books bookmarks that he put in every single safer in his library. That's that's. I mean, uh, did you? Uh, he used to he's walk the, into Shiur, right? Yeah, yeah. Right? There were stacks of Sfarim. <laughs> exactly. Stacks of Sfarim. And, and, and we used to sit in Shiur. It was a Shiur we had every week, right? For an hour and a half of Shailok to Chubot. Right? Questions and answers. And he used to sit, and whoever raised their hand, right? One after another. Never wrote down anything. One, two, three, ten questions from the crowd. And then he used to answer. The, the, oh, before he answered, he said, Could you give me that safer? Could you give me that safer? Could you give me that safer? Over there, there are two sphere in my knee. Over there, right? And then one after another, he answered everybody's question. And we're asking tough questions. Sure. You know, uh, we, we we're not giving him an easy time. And we always left there inspired. We always left there with a sense of th- there's emis to this Torah. There's not just a bunch of mumbo jumbo that they're telling us to do. There's, 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 it's real. It's real. And I think that when I think about Rabbi Gold, Rabbi Shalom Gold, Rabbi Avram Shalom Gold, somebody pointed out at the shiva I was at that Avram Shalom is Rosh Tevas of Eish. Oh, wow. He was a... Right? And when you take the word gold, right? First of all, gold is the have, which is... Precious. It's not just precious, it's mezukak. Ah, right. It's, it's refined. Right. But you change around the two letters in gold and it becomes gadol. It's Eish gadol. Wow. I said, oh my gosh, that's, that's exactly what he is. In my article I wrote into our tidbits, I literally wrote, he's a, he's a live fire. He, he used to come to the OU Israel Center and give shear at the Avram Silver College. He was dean of the, of the college. He worked here at the OU for 22, 23 years. And he used to walk into this building. And he came in. You, you saw that his battery is fully charged and he's ready to give that shear. And when he gave the shear, he used to give it the main hole downstairs. First of all, you can hear a pin drop. And second of all, the masses that would come to the shear. I'm feeling it now. That, that, were, were drinking fire, okay? Not, not drinking Torah, they were drinking the, the, the Torah that was on fire with positive, positive look. And Rav Gold grew up in, in, in Nari Yisrael. He grew up in, in, in Torah Vedas. When, when Rosh Yeshiva, I mean, at the Levaya, they said thank you to the, the Menalim of Torah Vedas then. Wow. He passed away in 88. Because he grew up in, in a family with no money. And with Pasha, the Torah with us took him and his brothers in, right? Not for the tuition, oh, sure. right? If there was any tuition, right? But they believed in their Shalom gold. Then it was little Shalom, right? And, but they said, you know something? If there's a Jew that wants to learn Torah, we're here to teach it. They had no idea who Rosh Shalom's gold was going to be. But that understanding... That we have a sense of responsibility to teach over Torah. And with gold moving to Toronto and opening their Israel in Toronto, 
and going to West Hempstead and building the Eru and building up the Kehillah and then ultimately moving to Israel. And they, they didn't have an easy time here in Israel. I grew, in Harno, grew up in Harnov. Next door, right? Was, right? But my, my Bubby and Zaidi, Aleim Shalom, literally lived in the next building over. They dove into Rabbi Gold Shul, Rabbi Gold did the Levias. They were, he, was, he, he was their Rebbe. And th- there was no such thing as Rabbi Gold passing by their house without waving hello, right, in Hanov. There was no such thing as me coming to spend Shabbos or Friday, every Friday night I dive with my Zaidi. We ate at my Bobby and Zaidi's house. I learned not far from there. I used to come to Hanov a lot. And I got to see as a kid go over and ask Shilas to Rabbi Gold the love and attention that he gave to every person, to, to every little okay. kid, right? Wow. But you saw that, and then you saw the shiro that, was, that he was giving, and the, the excitement and power of Torah. And, and, and he said, wow, this is, this is, this is, this is, this is something I want to adopt. I heard of Gold is the prime educator. He's the educator, the, 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 the bring over of Torah. So what would you say that we could take from a Gold's an educational his message? What can we take today? You know, it's, it's so fresh in our, I, I, I just, it's, it's, it's so fresh. What, what do we do now? How do we take that ish gadol and, and bring it down today? I think, first of all, we have to acknowledge the fact that it doesn't come without Limo Torah. It doesn't come without sitting. Rabbi Gold used to take me, tell me, it takes him two days to prepare his shir. Wow. So people say, oh, Rabbi Gold gave such incredible shir. First of all, he used to walk into my office when he finished the shir. <sighs> okay? It was like, Rabbi Gold, what happened? <sighs> right? And part of it was because he was very dramatic. But part of it is because he, he really prepared every shear. He said, if, if 80, 90, 100 people are coming to listen to my shear, I got to give a chashivas. I, I, I got to take them seriously. They're busy people. They're taking out of the day. They're driving to the OU Israel Center. They're you know, spending the time here. They're driving back. I got to take, take it seriously. And the hours that he spent preparing the shiur, you say to yourself, wow, that's a person that, that, that understands that, that, he, that he has to pass something on. When he told me that he wants to stop giving shiurim here, he said, Avi, I have so much Torah, I want to put into this farm. I want them to live on. And I think that that's the message that we should take from him. You know, the word ash, fire, has a very different meaning on Tisha B'Av. We think of the burning of Torah. We think of the burning of Beis HaVikdash. But Rabbi Gold told us, showed us, taught us, that Torah could be given over in fire. I think Rav Drukman as well. Where you're, where you're able to take a Torah that is, that is, that is passionate, that's emes. When Rabbi Gold got up there and, and he, he had his political opinions and he was for Eretz Yisrael HaShalema and he was for, right, and he was against the, the, the peace agreements and he was, and he came with, 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 with with power, and and he he wasn't shy of anything. What he believed is what he said, and what he said is what he believed. He didn't fudge thing, fudge anything up for anybody. He didn't pretend for anybody. Emes, Emes, Mamish Emes. I was sitting at the shiva, and there's a story that somebody told over there that Mamish sat with me. It was um, Mr. Jacobs from, uh, from Harnov. 
He said that he was walking on the street not far from the OU Israel Center. He said Rabbi Gold was probably on his way to the OU Israel Center. And the siren goes off on Yom Azikaron. And he's walking a bit behind Rabbi Gold, and the siren goes off, and he stops and stands. And then Rabbi Gold is standing as well. And after the siren stops, he walks faster to catch up to Rabbi Gold. And he sees Rabbi Gold crying. And he said, Rabbi, and without, without him being able to ask a question, Rabbi Gold said, I felt it. I felt every single soldier. And that's the Klal Yisrael year that he was. You know, on, on Tisha B'Av, you mentioned the idea of fire. So we say that. And we say in the Tefillah of, of, of Tisha B'Av, we say, Be'eshet Sata, and in fire you burnt it. Be'eshet What's that message of the fire? I mean, Be'eshet Ta'atid you're, you're going to build it also in the future in right. fire. What, what is that? So I, I think that, I understand a new meaning of that by these two Rebbe, Rabbi Gold and Rabbi There's a Hasidish story that says that a man, a Hasidish Rebbe, was outside his house on Shabbat afternoon as his house was burning down. And, you know, they're, the day is different. But in Hilchot Shabbat, you can't put out a fire, right? You can only say certain things. So a per, person in his town comes by, you know, everybody's out of the house, they're all fine. The Rebbe's watching and fellow Jew, fellow member of the town says, Rebbe, if you could save something from this house, what would you save? Your farm, your possessions, your memories, your, 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 your ritual stuff? I'd save the fire. Rebbe said, if there's something I'd take from my house, it's, not the, it's the fire, the brine, that's what keeps us going. I think that's the trial of Tisha B'Av. That the esh and the fire, you're going to rebuild it, that fire we need. That's why Tisha B'Av is a moed. Because now it's a new beginning. But there's that power we have to relinquish, we have to take back, and now use that fire. These gdolim gave us that fire. The esh gadolim of gold. The esh of drip. And we have to take that fire now and say, how do we bring that fire back? That fire that warms, that builds, that connects, and builds out their beta mikdash. Amen. After hearing the perspectives of both Rabbis Berman and Friedman on Rabbis Druckmann and Gold, I'd like to share with you a word or two about my connection with both of these individuals. I've known Rabbi Shalom Gold, Zichron Olevrocha, may he rest in peace, for many, many years. He studied in Baltimore, probably before I came to Baltimore. He has smicha from Yeshivas Ner Yisroel. He's a very prominent rabbi in several positions in the United States. He was a rabbi in Toronto, Canada. And then in the early 1980s, many years ago, 50 years ago, he made Aliyah to Eretz Yisroel and has since become one of the most prominent advocates of Aliyah, of having Jews living in the diaspora, move to Israel, live in Israel full-time, influence the culture, the education, the spirituality of the land of Israel. And he was very, very firm and clear and articulate and demanding of each of us who well, that chose to live and practice and serve the Jewish people in the diaspora. And when he comes before the Kisei HaKavot, when he comes before the Ribbono Shalolam, he will be able to say with all honesty that he tried his best to get every Jew to return home. And we've lost his voice, and we have to take his talks, almost all of them are, available on recordings, and listen to what he had to say. He had a very, very important, urgent message for us. Rabbi Sholem Gold. Rabbi Druckmann, too, 
was a dedicated, firm spokesperson for Am Yisroel, Eretz Yisroel, Torah Yisroel. He too was an outstanding Talmud Chacham, an educator, a person who created and nurtured educational institutions throughout the land of Israel, who had a tremendous influence upon his students, upon his disciples, upon his colleagues, upon all who knew him. I especially turn usually at the time of year of Yom Ha'atzma'ut, Yom Rushulayim, to a little pamphlet that I have in my possession and consult very often uh, with some divrei Torah for, of Rav Drokman, Zechet Tzadik Levrocha. I'm not going to go into the entire piece. It's entitled, Bishuv Hashem Eshivat Siyom. We say this in the Shir Malos, the Pasuk and Tehillim that we're all familiar with. When God returns the, 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 the lost ones, the ones in the diaspora to the land of Israel, Hayinu Kechomim. Hayinu Kechomim. We will be as dreamers. He begins his Dvar Torah by quoting from three sources, the Ibn Ezra, the Radak, and the Me'iri, three medieval commentators upon Shir, upon Shir HaMalos, upon Tehillim. And, and, what the, and elaborates upon what they deal, how they define this notion of we were like dreamers, we will be as dreamers. And he has a different spin on it, which is very powerful. And it is as such. He's speaking as a person who knew the Jews of the diaspora, who met with them, who saw them as visitors in the land of Israel, and who tried to awaken them to what he saw as a necessary awakening, to awaken the Jews of the diaspora to return to the land of Israel. However, he said, Look at what the Pasuk is saying. God had brought, has brought back in our time, in our lifetimes, Shivas Zion, Jews who were all over the world. And he's brought us back from all of these places. The problem is that many of us look at Israel now, many of you who are living in the United States, in Canada, in Great Britain, in Australia, and wherever Jews are in South Africa, and looking upon it not as a reality, not as a real option, but only as a dream. Instead of realizing that we can in a moment make a decision to board a plane, to pick everything up, and to make Aliyah to move to Israel. God's bringing back in our day, in our time, this is not a dream. This is happening right now. Brothers, sisters, come back, live here. This is your home. However, Hayinu kechomen, nebach, nebach. Everyone's like dreamers. Yeah, it's a dream. You know, maybe one day I'll come, I'll come, I'll make aliyah. Maybe, well, but I can't right now. It's like it's like a dream to us. It's not a dream. And this was the message of Rav Chaim Drukman. Both are messages of the importance of Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel, and of all of us living there. And it's a lesson which we must all take to heart. The two men, great men, wise men, courageous men, leaders among men, and we must heed their lesson. May their memory, memories of both Rav Shalom Gold and Rav Chaim Drukman, be a blessing for us all. Sadly, this year, several months ago, we lost a different great leader, a fascinating person who also spent, if not all of his life, most of his life in Israel. And he lived a long time. He died at age 100. And he died on the same day that he delivered his last lesson, his last shayur, his last lesson in teaching Torah at age 100. When did he begin his career in teaching the yeshiva in Panavish and B'nai Brak? 80 years ago. His name was 
Rav Gershon Edelstein. And I have here a picture from the Mishpacha magazine of him really in very recent years. Rav Gershon Edelstein, Zecher Tzadik Levrocha. I personally had no connection with him except knowing that this man was a master mechanech, a master educator. No wonder. 80 years of experience means he began teaching young men Torah at age 20 and continued day by day over a course of 80 years until he died at age 100. And he had many, many important lessons to teach us. In, his, in recent years, he was interviewed in various modalities on the entire subject of education. And he had one dominant theme, and that theme was, you must treat your children, your students, kindly. Show them love. It is only through gentleness and love that you can reach the hearts of students. Torah can only be taught through love, tolerance, understanding, empathy, sympathy. And he felt strongly that no matter what type of problem a parent was facing with his or her child, or a teacher was facing with his or her disciple, student, pupil, one must always look at the good in each and every person. One must be ready to tolerate all sorts of difficulties, behavioral difficulties, religious commitment difficulties, stubbornness difficulties, reluctance to learning, learning disabilities. Whatever difficulties you were facing, you had to face them wisely, but kindly and gently with care and compassion. This was a lesson of Rav Gershon Edelstein, Zecher Tzadik Levrocha. It was considered, especially since the passing not too long ago, just last year, a year and one more so ago, Rav Chaim Kalievsky Zatzal, Rav Gershon st stood in the breach. He kind of took over that position, position of the leadership of the Torah world when you were 99 years old and obviously had your own difficulties at that age. Who doesn't have difficulties at such an age? He remained in that leadership position. He accepted it, lasted, unfortunately for us, for a relatively short time. But his message is a, an eternal message. It's a message that's not heard loudly enough in the world of Torah education. Of course there will be dropouts. Of course there will be people who have difficulties of one sort or another. But our job is to serve them all, to understand them all, to work with them all, and to never despair on any of one's children, children in the narrow sense of family children, children of the broad sense of children of Am Yisrael. B'nai Yisrael need the love of men like, and women like Rav Gershon Eilstein Zeich Tzadik Levrocha. I mentioned the leadership, educational leadership, of women as well. And in, in that note, I must mention an, a great woman leader in Chinuch, and I'm referring to Rebetzin David, the wife of Horav Yernis and David, and the daughter of Horav Agon, Rav Yitzchak Hutna Sechet Tzatik Levrocha. She, Rebetzin David, was his only child, his only daughter. And she died childless in the sense of having no children of her own. But she educated thousands upon thousands of women, including my wife, Javi, who was one of her Talmidot, and who felt strongly that Ebbets and David, who then was a young woman when she taught Javi, was the best teacher she ever had. And you'll hear this from many, many people. She had a role, by the way, in the preparation of her lamented father who died now so many years ago but we have many volumes of his works called Pachat Yitzchak written for us to use and she was instrumental in bringing those books to their final form and it is to her credit that we have Pachat Yitzchak uh, the Sefer, the collection of brilliant essays of her father which she helped 
to prepare. Yehi zichra baruch. May her memory as an educator and as a thinker and as a um, uh, woman with great didactic, great didactic skills, may her memory and the model she served for Jewish women be a credit to her memory, Ad Bias Goel. This past year, we lost many, many people to various tragic events, to terror, to enemy attacks, to illness, to age. And it's important that we remember them at this time. Tisha B'Av is such a time. I'd like to bring to your attention one such woman whose name was Hanna Nachenberg, N-A-C-H-E-N-B-E-R-G. Hanna Nachenberg died this year, just a few short weeks ago, a few short months ago, from an act of terror. The act of terror, however, did not happen in the year 2023. It happened exactly on August 9th, 2001. That's almost 22 full years ago. She was on that day in the pizza shop, which is familiar to many of us, of Zbaros in Yerushalayim, in the heart of Yerushalayim, right off on the corner of Rehov Yafo. She was in the restaurant in the pizza shop with her young baby daughter. The daughter survived the injuries of that terror bombing. And so did Mrs. Nachenberg. But Mrs. Nachenberg never recovered from those wounds. And she was in a coma from that day, August 9th, 2001, until this year, when she finally passed away. During all that time, 20 plus years, she was in a coma, she was in a hospital. Her daughter, when she grew up over these years, was never able to communicate with her because she was in a total, total deep coma. I'd like to share with you some writing that Mrs. Nachenberg's daughter did, reflecting as a teenage youngster on a mother who is not dead, but also not alive. Let's hear what she has to say. I'm taking this quoting from the Jerusalem Post, updated June 1st, 2023. And it reads, New York-born Hannah Nachenberg was 31 years old when the bombing happened at the Jerusalem Zbaro Pizza Place. It was a Wednesday that she died almost 22 years after a Palestinian suicide bomber bombed the Zbaro Place, putting her in a vegetative state. With her, in Zabaros was her two-year-old daughter, Sara, one of the few to survive the attack unscathed. So here you have daughter Sara, two years old, and mother Chana, who died at that point this day, this week, just a month or so ago. It was a man named Iz al-Din Shuhail al-Masri who bombed this Barra place on the bustling corner of King George Street and Yaffa Road on August 29, 2001, killing 15 people, including seven children and a pregnant woman and wounding 130. The bomb that he carried to the restaurant included nails meant to cause extra Injury. It's impossible to imagine a woman 
in a vegetative state for almost 22 years. What was her life like? Was it a life? But it is possible not only to imagine, but to learn from her surviving daughter, two years old when her mother was destroyed in her presence in an innocent outing at a pizza shop, and from her father, from Mrs. Trachtenberg's husband, who lived on and on to this very day. But the little girl, the two-year-old, has discussed numerous times for the media making public statements about some of her experiences growing up as a little girl, as a teenager, and now as a woman in her, woman in her early 20s, about what those years were like for her. Obviously, when she was two years old, she couldn't even verbalize what she had experienced and what she was experiencing. But as she grew up, she began to f resent the fact that she had no mother. She began to resent the fact that people were asking her about her feelings about her mother, whom she never really knew. She began to wish that no one would ever ask her or talk to her again about her mother because she had no way of dealing with the concept of a mother. Her father was her father and her mother. And she spoke that way. And then one day, probably in her late teens, she had a, a close friend, a boy more or less her age, whom she found a kind of kindred spirit who she could talk to. And she decided that she would go with him to her mother's bedside. She rarely went to visit her mother because she couldn't communicate and couldn't be communicated with by her mother. And somehow, in the company of her young friend, she was able to visit her mother's bedside, to speak to her somehow, and to feel that she had been heard. This is a tragedy which, <laughs> it's unimaginable to see what this young woman could experience, and what of course the woman dying after 20 plus years in a vegetative state, what kind of a life she could have had, how we ought to come to terms with such a life. Now she has been brought to rest. I'd like to pay some homage to some of the individuals who were killed in acts of terror, similar to Zbaro's, but in more recent times. And let's just begin with this past September, less than a year away, a year ago. Major Bar Falach, 30 years old, of Netanya, deputy commander of the Nachal Reconnaissance Battalion, was killed in an exchange of fire with terrorists in an incident north of Jenin. About a week later, Shulamit Rachel Ovadia of Chalon, an 84 year old woman, was bludgeoned to death in a terror attack near her home. On the 8th of October this past year, Sergeant Noah Lazar, 18 years old, of Bat Hefer, was killed in a terror attack that took place at a checkpoint near the Shuafat refugee camp in East Jerusalem. Later in October, Staff Sergeant Ido Baruch, just 21 years old, of Gadera, a soldier in the Givati Reconnaissance Unit, was wounded while on duty securing a march by settlers. He was rushed to the nearest hospital, where he later succumbed to his wounds. On the 29th of October, Ronan Hanania, 49, of Kiryat Arba, was shot and killed in a terrorist attack near the entrance to Givat Ha'avot on a Shabbat evening. On the 8th of November, 
Shalom Sofer, 63 years old of Petach Tikva, succumbed to wounds sustained in a terror attack at the Pal near the Palestinian village of Al Fundak. On the 18th of November, Mati Ashkenazi, 59, of Yavne, killed by ramming, st stabbing terror attack. 15th of November, Tamir Avichai, 50 years old, of Kiryat Nitafim, was killed in a ramming, stabbing attack near Ariel. And 15th of November also, Michael Ledigin, 36, of Batyam, killed in a ramming, stabbing terror attack near the city of Ariel. 23rd of November, Aryeh Stupak, 16 years old, was killed in one of two almost simultaneous explosions at bus stops, the entrance to Yerushalayim. Later in November, Tadasa Tashuma ben Maada, 50, of Yerushalayim, succumbed to the wounds from that explosion, the entrance to Yerushalayim. January 27th, Natalie Mizrahi, 45, of Beit Shemesh, was murdered together with her husband, Eli, and five other Israelis in a murderous attack Friday night outside a synagogue in Jerusalem's Neve Yaakov neighborhood. And her husband, Eli Mizrahi, 48, in that attack. January 2023, Asher Natan, 14 years old, of Neve Yaakov, was killed Friday night in a terror attack outside a synagogue near his own. January 27th, 2023, Rafael ben Eliyahu, married and father of four, was one of seven victims outside that attack outside a shul in Neve Yaakov. So, in that same incident, Ilya Sosansky, 26, was one of the seven victims. That one of the second victims was also Shaul Chai, 68, killed outside that same synagogue, Neve Yaakov neighborhood. So too, Irina Korolova, age 60, was one of those seven victims. February 2023, Yaakov Yisrael Pale of Yerushalayim, one of three victims killed in a ramming attack. That same day, Alter Shlomo Letterman, 20, was killed in a car ramming attack in Ramot. The next day, February 23, the brother of Yaakov Pali, Asher Menachem Pali, six years old, I'm sorry, eight years old of Yerushalayim, the older brother of Yaakov Yisrael Pali, succumbed to his wounds in that ramming attack in Ramot. Border police officer staff Sergeant Asil Sued of Husanya in northern Israel was killed in an attack by a routine during a routine bus inspection by a 13-year-old Palestinian outside the East Jerusalem refugee camp. February 23, Hillel Menachem Yaniv was one of two brothers killed in a terrorist attack. Yagel Yaakov Yaniv, age 20, was the older, was the younger of those two brothers. Around the same time, Ilan Ganelis, 26 years old, a dual U.S.-Israeli citizen, killed by terrorists in a shooting attack on Highway 90, March 2023. Or Eshkar, 32 years old, of Tel Aviv, a terror attack on Dizinga Street, March 9th. April 2023, Maya D. and her sister Rina D., both of the West Bank settlement of Efrat, were killed on a Friday. A few days later, April 2023, Alessandro Pani, 35, a lawyer from Rome who was in Israel on vacation, killed in a ramming attack. April 11th, Lucy Olea D., 48 years old, the mother of the two daughters, was, died from the wounds she sustained in that terror attack. May 2023, Inga Avramyan, 82 years old, of Rehovot, Rehovot was killed when a rocket attack launched from Gaza during Operation Shield and Arrow, struck her home. May 2023, Mayor Tamari was attacked and murdered in a drive-by shooting near his home. It's just a partial list to the end of May of soldiers, policemen, 
innocent children, innocent adults killed by terror just in recent months up until six or seven weeks ago. And there have been several since. Of course, it's important to remember each of these people in every way that we can. Once again, the lesson of Vahachai Yitain El Libo. It's a time today, Tisha B'Av, for mourning. For all of us, we are mourning for these individuals forever. Certainly, their close ones, husbands, children, parents, will never get over this terrible tragedy of this past year, which we mark today on Tisha B'Av. We all must use this somehow for the better. And one way is to examine ourselves with reference to what I've been speaking about all day today so far. We must somehow overcome sinas There's nothing to help us remember the importance of each and every life as reflecting upon the death of innocent people as we have just reflected. In a moment, we'll have the opportunity. We mentioned the two Yaniv brothers, 20 and 22 years old, and how they were killed by terror, terrorists. In a moment, we will have the ability to hear a live video of the eulogy that the sister of these two brothers, Rachel Yaniv, gave in their memory. And we will hear from them. You will he see the video momentarily. Thank you. הערב הזה אני, רחל, ניצבת כאן לזכרם של אחי האהובים, הלל ויגל, שנרצחו ועוד תראו חלל ענק בלב. אני רוצה להזכיר כי במשך חודשיים נרצחו עוד אחים, הילדים יעקב ואשר פליי, והאחים רינה ומיידי, שנרצחו ביחד עם אמם לוסי. בחיים לא תכננתי שביום הזיכרון אתייצב כאן כחלק ממשפחת השכול, חלק ממשפחה ענקית שלא התכוננה מעולם להיות כזאת, שנושאת עיניה לשמיים בתחינה שמותם של יקיריה לא יהיה לשווא, שעם ישראל חי ויחיה חיים מלאים של שמחה ופריחה, ויתמו הרצח והשנאה מארצנו, שנשוב ונתאחד להיות עם אחד, כי כשאנחנו ביחד לא יוכלו לנצח אותנו. כי אנשים אחים אנחנו. אנחנו. למרות המחיר הבלתי ניתן לתפיסה ששילמנו, אנחנו ממשיכים לאהוב. לאהוב את הארץ שלנו, לאהוב את מדינת ישראל ואת צבא ההגנה לישראל. עצוב לנו כל כך ביום הזיכרון הראשון ללא בני משפחתנו, שעדיין לא הקלנו שהם אינם עימנו. עצוב ומוזר כל כך לומר, יהא זכרם של יעקב ואשר פלאי. ואחיות רינה ומיידי ואימאם לוסי ואחי הלל ויגל ואחי הלל ויגל האהובים יהיה זכרם ברוך who is the executive vice president of the Orthodox Union. Chavi and I have known Rabbi Hauer when he was yet a student at Ner Israel Yeshiva in Baltimore, he would occasionally visit our home. And we remember him from those days very fondly as a very gentle soul, a person with great depth, uh, very serious at times, and just exuberantly friendly and open-hearted at other times. Uh, he is now the leadership of the OU. He is certainly a tremendous asset, not only to the OU, to the Orthodox Union, but to all of Am Yisrael, because he has a sense of Am Yisrael, the Jewish people as a nation. It's not this group or that group of people here or people there. And his connection and focus upon the problems and how to solve them, the problems of local communities, the problems of Jewish communities all over the world, the problems of the land of Israel. He has so much to contribute. And we wish him tremendous hatzlacha on all of his works. I'm especially proud of the fact that occasionally when he introduces me to an audience, 
He will refer to me as his mentor. Very proud that he gives me that title, um, whether I deserve it or not. Uh, but I want him to give him the opportunity on this presentation to be part of my Tish above my 35 year old um, uh, uh, career as a person who gives this type of a talk on the website uh, to the entire, entire world, whoever wants to tune in. I hereby present to you Rabbi Moshe Hauer. In 1913, it was a Shemitah year, and there was a, a great dispute about how to handle the Shemitah and the, the Heterim, the special permissions which were granted uh, that perhaps went sometimes beyond the permission that was granted. A debate that existed, that, that occurred between the, the Ridvaz and Rav Kook, two Gedolei Olam, two great Torah scholars. The Ridvaz took a much stronger position and there was an exchange of letters between him and Rav Kook. And the Ridvaz just simply could not understand how, how Rav Kook could look so favorably on those who were really disregarding and it seemed to be you know, trampling the mitzvah of Shemitah. And Rav Kook, in his way, he responds that, of course, he dislikes the negative of what those people were doing. But his way, and he says it almost as, uh, as just a, a general commentary that, you know, he studies not just the open Torah, the nigla, but also the nistar, also the hidden Torah. And in a sense, in the same way, he looked not only at the nigla, at the open and obvious uh, behaviors and qualities of those who were doing things that were disturbing, but he also saw the nistar. He also saw that which was inside them, and he saw the good, and he wished to strengthen, support, and magnify the good. You know that as we face the challenges of sinas chinam, of hatred, free hatred, uh, the level of division, which continues to be strong and in certain ways uh, in these days, in this past year, uh, stronger than many of us can remember uh, between Jews. And it's so jarring and so disturbing. We know we're mourning today on Tisha B'av over the Churban and Habayis, the destruction of the Bayis Sheni, which came because of Sinas Chinam, and we don't seem to have been able to learn our lesson. Chazal instruct us about the importance and the significant weight of speaking properly about each other, about Shmiras Haloshon. And it's, it's so difficult, it's the ultimate, the, you know, the most direct expression, one might say, of Sina, is to speak negatively about each other. Uh, but uh, it's such a difficult thing to safeguard ourselves against. How do we do it? So David HaMelech, in the most famous verse about Shmiras Haloshon, told us exactly how to do it. He said, Who's the person who desires life? Who loves days? Liros Tov, to see good. Safeguard your tongue from speaking evil. You have to see good. You know, there's nothing that any one of us, it seems, maybe I should only speak for myself, can do in a sustained way with self-control. If we go on a diet, and we're incredibly successful. We def deprive ourselves of every food that we enjoy, and we manage to lose tens of pounds, uh, and it's a great success. But at a certain point in time, if we feel like we're starving ourselves and we're not having what we really like, we yo-yo, right? We go back up. Uh, and the way we succeed in the dieting is if we actually start liking healthier foods and leaner foods, then we say, hey, we found something that we like. We can do that. It doesn't require tremendous self-control anymore. If we need to exercise and we force ourselves to do something which is drudgery and boring, um, we can do it for a while because we know that it's important, but we can't sustain it. The trick to sustaining good behaviors is to find behaviors that we can enjoy 
or to actually transform our tastes to enjoy them. If you, if you, dis, you realize that, wow, you know, when I do this, when I play racquetball, it's so enjoyable. I love this, the, the social aspect. I love the competition. I love the rush. Then it's not like, oh gosh, I have to go do it. Like if I'm just you know, running on a treadmill and don't find that in, in, enjoyable. You take it away from being self-controlled to being something that you enjoy. And David HaMelech said that it's very hard for a person to just hold their tongue whenever there's something that they want to say. But you know what's not as hard? Is to want to see good, to see the good in other people. When you see the other people, then your tongue won't speak evil. You won't be just focused and fixated on the negative. As Rav Cook said, sometimes, you know, when you just look at the outside, you could see bad, but we have to look a little bit deeper and see the good, see the nistar, see the, the goodness which is in people, to focus our sights more on the good and relish that, and sort of in that way just eliminate, neutralize the otherwise overwhelming compulsion to express ourselves negatively about each other. Ure'ei betuv Yerushalayim kol yemei chayecha. That's another instruction of David HaMelech. As we look on this anniversary of the Cher HaMeraglim, where people came to Eretz Yisrael, they saw wonderful things, but they focused on the negative things. We have a mandate which we fulfill and will, God willing, fulfill forward to see the good, to see the good in Yerushalayim, to see the good in Eretz Yisrael, to see the good in every Jew, in every one of our fellow Jews. Let it not be a challenge that we have to contain ourselves from speaking negatively, but let us instead be able to recognize in each other the passion for a Jewish future the passion to do for kindness, the passion to do the right thing. Sometimes confusion or difference of opinion about what that right thing is, but to somehow see, be able to see, hopefully at the core of everyone, the tov, the desire for good, that while it is sometimes covered, it is always there and may make our task of avaschina of loving each other, caring for each other, and bringing together our people, bringing us together with our people, make it, may it make it smoother and easier. As we go through the haunted history of the Jewish people, now we jumped from the first crusades, the experience of the Jewish people in Christian lands, and then we kind of jumped way ahead to the current year, various tragedies, and we heard the eloquent eulogy for the Yinon brothers, terror victims by their dear sister. I'd like to go back in time now to a very crucial year, obviously in world history, but in Jewish history as well. And that's the year 1492. And the same place as Columbus departed from in 1492 to discover the new world. Ferdinand and Isabella were the king and the queen. The minister of finance for the kingdom of Spain was a man named Yitzchak Abarbanel, Jewish man, an expert on consulting for governments on financial matters, the Secretary of the Treasury, the equivalent of that, Minister of Finance, perhaps involved in the financing of Columbus's voyage. We'll speak a little bit about him personally later. Some years ago, in one of these webcasts, I mentioned the fact that it was difficult to find a kina, a lamentation, written specifically for the expulsion of the Jews from Spain in 1492. But Jews had been living there for hundreds and hundreds of years. And now we're being asked to leave the country unless they would 
convert to, to Christianity. Some of them did yield to the temptation to convert. Some went into hiding. Most left for wherever they could find refuge. That entire tragedy, which was a great tragedy in Jewish history, really a, one with tremendous impact and consequences over the centuries. There, I mentioned that it was difficult to find a kina, and someone contacted me, a good friend of mine, Mr. Ira Epstein. He supplied me actually earlier this morning with one kina that he thought was especially relevant, especially easy to teach, um, which we're about to teach now. The kina itself has an unknown author, but it's a beautiful poem and very, very moving and really captures as it is entitled, the Kina al Shemad Castilia, the Kina for the destruction of the Castile, a certain area or region of Spain. Again, sadly, we do not know the author's name, but let's hear what he has to say, and you can find this in your booklet in the appropriate section. Look for the title, Kina al Shemad Castilia has a refrain. The refrain is, Mazos Asa Elohim Lanu. What is this that God has done to us? Imagine being asked to leave the country where your ancestors lived, Spain, to just leave it and go, depart. Mazos, what did God do? Miyom Bro Elohim Adam. You can follow me in the text if you find it in your booklet. From the day that God created mankind. Shemad gazol, gadol kaze lo kadam. There was never previously such a terrible shemad, such a terrible persecution, to let hundreds of thousands of people drown in the Atlantic Ocean rather than remain in Spain. Allah Yehudim, with a shemad, a decree against the Jews, liabdam, to destroy them. Aye hatsur, where is the rock, the security of God since we have been redeemed? And again, the refrain, what did God do to us? We have expired. We are all forlorn. Where are the communities of Castile? And where, what happened to Aragon? and to Shazilia, towns, cities, with great Jewish communities. Asher hipil osa osam ya lefnei tsar asher kilanu. That God threw us down, cast us down before this enemy who will destroy us. And again, mazos osa lo kimlanu, hen govanu kulanu ovadnu. Yichalnu moshia v'goel. We hoped for a, a savior, a redeemer, Shabbos Levorech Es Yisroel, to, to bless the Sabbath for us. But Nehepach Machne Yisroel, but the camp of Israel was transformed. Umimoshvoseinu Higlanu. And from our homeland, we were exiled. Again, Mazos Elokim, Osa Elokim Lanu. What has God done to us? Rov Kehilos Hakdoshos, most of the holy congregations. Yeshivot, uvate midrashot, yeshivos, schools, and houses of study. Hayulo ivenu yerushot, they became the possessions of our enemies. We had beautiful school buildings, beautiful synagogues, synagogues are now churches, the schools are now who knows what. Vishadai ma'od hafilanu, God has confused us. Mazos, what is this? Portugal. We tried to escape to Portugal. Maybe we'll be able to settle there. We went from circle to circle, from here to there. Even there in Portugal, you know, the, the wheel of fate just rolled over us. 
what's what's lacking except death? Mazos No, what has God done? Yotzu Achenu Gerushim, our brothers, our brethren went out, chased out, expelled. Bachurim Zekenim Vishishim, young men, old men, very old men. For Gazru Gezerot Kashim Ad Hashem Od Hadimonu. They decreed, decreed terrible decrees until we are, we are just done for. Again, Mazos, what has God done? Nifalnu Meirov Yeshuos. We have become um, panicked because of the various salvations which we were promised. Kolayom Rabos Veros, every day is, is terrible. Rov Charados Uzvos, terrible fright and terrible horror. Umuraro Savana, we have swallowed bitter herbs. Mazos, what has God done? Vayachivu Pihem Oleinu, they open their mouths wide to us. In other words, they curse us, they scream at us. V'lakhu Machmad Einenu, they took away our precious, most precious possessions. V'votech Nesiyos V'sifreinu, they took away our synagogues and our books. Uvonim Asherti Pachnu, and the children whom we raised. Mazos, what is this? Ona, please. El Shochein Meromim, God who dwells on high. Sholach Nechama Lahalomim, bring consolation Lahalumim, bring consolation to, to those of us who are just silenced. Kabeitz Nidachim Ba'amim, gather together those who have been chased away among the nations. Nifla'ot Aseimanu, do wonders for us. And the conclusion is the refrain. Mazos Oselo Kimlano, what has God done for us? And Gavana, we have expired. Kulano Avadna, we are all lost. Kina lo Yadua al Geru Sephorad Avroham David. This is an unknown Kina by a person named Avram David. We don't even know who the author was. That's the the, the a kina written for the entire experience of the Spanish expulsion. There's one person I just mentioned that I'd like to say at least something about, something insufficient. And that is Don. Don means sir, someone with a very high political position in Spain. Don Isaac Abravanel. The Abravanel family to this very day is a distinguished family among the Jewish people. But it was so hundreds of years ago, long before the expulsion of the Jews from Spain in 1492. The leader of the Jewish community, as well as the most trusted advisor in the cabinet of King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella, was Rabbi Isaac Abarbanel, Yitzhak Abarbanel. He was the author of a vast, vast number of books. He wrote an extensive, thorough commentary on all of the Bible, on the Hamisha Chum Torah, on the Nevi'im Muksuvim. And he wrote many books in addition to that, philosophical books, Rosh Mana. He wrote a commentary on the Mora Nevuchim, on the Ramam's Mora Nevuchim, and, and various other books. He was born in Portugal, not in Spain. And in Portugal, too, he rose to become the main financial advisor to the King of Portugal. King of Portugal passed away. His replacement exiled Rabbi Bar Barbanel, and he ran, fled to Spain. In Spain, he was again promoted to very high positions in the government until the king and queen called him in and gave him a proposition. Either he could convert to Christianity or he had to leave the country. So he left the country. And he went from place to place, from exile to exile. There's one biography that I have in, in, in English language that I have in my hand here. It was written by a man, B. Netanyahu, but this is not Bibi Netanyahu, the current prime minister of the state of Israel. Rather, it is his father, 
whose first name began with a B, and who was the son of Rabbi Nathan, hence the name Netanyahu. Can't give you a complete detailed biography of him. But I can say that this book is a very comprehensive one. It is divided into two sections. Part two is Barbanel because of his intellectual achievements, his world outlook, his view of history, his political opinions, and his messianism, his reflections on the entire idea of Mashiach. But part one is simply an outline of his biography. I'm not going to read you the book, just the, in the table of contact, contents, the, the main points of his life. He, the, the Bini Netanyahu writes, he was a financier and a statesman. Portugal for him was a happy haven. Family, childhood, early literary efforts in the service of the king, fall and escape. He escaped from Portugal to Spain. Spain, land of persecution. On the Portuguese border, the Catholic kings, advancement at court, the great crisis. That's a quick summary of Spain. So he fled. And he fled to various places in and around Italy. So chapter three is Naples, scene of trouble. On Italy's threshold, a Neapolitan court, courtier, he was in the court of the king of Naples, in Sicilian exile, he was in Sicily in exile. He visited the island of Corfu in the middle of the Mediterranean, where he discovered one of his own books that he had written, the only extant, the only existing volume of that book on earth was in the Isle of Corfu, when he happened to find it there in his stay there. And he went to a place called Monopoly, and that was his shelter in the storm, where he completed many of his works. From there he went to Venice, the last refuge. And in Venice, it was a new rise to prominence. He again became prominent in the government of Venice. Venice then was a city-state. It was not more than a city. It was, it was more than a city. It was, it was kind of a little mini-government. Again, new rise to prominence, the final efforts. Interestingly enough, and so typical, when Abarbanel, is often referred to as the Abarbanel, Rabbi Yitzchak Abarbanel, when he passed away, the government of Venice, which had honored him in his lifetime, refused to bury him because we do not bury Jews in Venice. So his entire life was this victimized hero, this person who accomplished so much politically, secularly, and also so very much in terms of his contribution to Jewish literature, especially to biblical explanations, the biblical perushim. Barbanel is unbelievable. I was studying for some time now with someone on a regular basis, a regular Seder we have by telephone one day a week. <laughs> we decided we're going to study the Barbanel on Beratius. So, so far, you know where we're up to? We've done this for about a year now. Beratius we studied, the word Beratius, Bara, the word Bara, and Elohim, the word God. Beratius, Bara, Elohim, that's as far as we got. We didn't even finish the first post yet. He's so thorough, so comprehensive, so brilliant, dazzling. Just in, uh, and that, those three words, commentary on those three words are themselves about 20 pages. That's the man who, they refused to bury him in Venice. He was buried in some nearby uh, 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 suburb of, of Venice where his grave is to this very day. This is just a taste, a, a one kinna, yes, by an anonymous author, an unknown author, and one individual who represents the entire tragedy of the Jewish people. You know, success, failure, success, failure, home, refuge, refugee, terrible. That's the life of the Abarbanel. That's the brief story and brief kina on the expulsion of the Jews from Spain. I have here in my hand, in a sense, it's a favorite work of mine by a very fascinating person. It's a little pamphlet entitled Haharuga Olecha, the person who is victimized, tortured and killed in your name, in God's name. It was written by the author of the Nesiva Shalom. And the Nesiva Shalom was the Slonim Rebbe, the Hasidish Rebbe from Slonim. 
And he, during the uh, Holocaust years, was in Eretz Yisrael, in the land of Israel. He was called upon then, the Jews began to know what was happening in Europe, what was happening in the Holocaust, knowing about the millions and millions of people who were being killed, butchered, murdered, drowned, burned, etc. And he gave various talks during this period and the immediate aftermath of the Holocaust. And this is how he begins a talk that he gave in ER, roughly May of Tavshin Hay, 1945, just at the end of the war, World War II. He writes, We've now begun to discover all the news of this terrible, terrible destruction. And he's speaking to an audience and he tells them, We have gathered together here at this frightful, and dark, very dark moment. It's after what has happened to the Jewish people. What has occurred to us now, this 1945, is the most tragic and frightful event that has no comparison. Millions of our brothers. Hatovim Shabaam, the best of our people, the best of our nation. Nitbechu have been slaughtered. Venisrifu Chayim and burned alive. Bitsura Kolkachach Zoris in such a cruel manner. Niskayamnu Banu Nevuas Daniel. What has been fulfilled here is the prophecy of Daniel. Alasher Yikre Baacharis Hayamim. This will be the most memorable, the most tragic event in Jewish history. Unprecedented, unprecedented sorrows. This is his introduction to his various talks in the wake of the Holocaust. There's so much, so much to be said about the Holocaust, and so much that I've said in previous, previous, um, talks that I've given in this context and in other contexts about the Holocaust. In some ways, personally, I'm obsessed with the Holocaust. When I remember that when I was born, when I was born, my second cousins who were my age, infants, literally infants, months old, were being thrown into the furnaces of Treblinka and Belgets in Eastern Europe, and I was being coddled and fondled in, in Brooklyn, New York, in the United, these great United States of America. So I have this awareness that as I was being born, being pampered as a baby, <laughs> my close family was being butchered, gassed, stabbed in, in, in Eastern Europe, mostly in Galicia and Poland, in what today is the, uh, the Western Ukraine. Um, I'm just possessed by it all. And people sometimes turn to me and say, you know, why are you so possessed? Why are you thinking of it so much? What, I mean, what, 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 just forget about it. Get past it. Get over it, so to speak. Very few people are quite that callous about it, but they wonder about why I and so many others are just obsessed with this. When I sat near the deathbed of my father-in-law, may he rest in peace, and he was a victim of the Holocaust or a survivor of the Holocaust, and he turned to me with his last words, uh, asking... Tell me, tell me, he said to me, how could this have happened? A welt, a whole world, nishto. I couldn't communicate full sentences then, so he said, a whole world, gone, gone. How could it be? How did this happen? What's, what is this? The only thing we can really do about the Holocaust, we living at this point in time, is to remember. Remembering itself is important. And for this, I, I refer you to a book, which in turn refers you to a book. It's a collection of the Mamore Musar, of the Musar speeches, Musar talks, given by a member of the great uh, Mir and Chevron family, Rav Hagon, Rav Aryeh Finkel, now passed on, Zechat Tzadik Levrocha. It's called Har Yeh And he has an essay 
about Tsar Hagalut Tikvata Geula. The hope for redemption comes out of feeling the pain of the diaspora. To the extent that you can feel the pain of all that we've been talking about, to that extent we can begin to feel redeemed. And the author Rabbi Finkel quotes from the Mesha Chachma, the great author of the Mesha Chachma from the Arsameach, Rameh of Simcha of Dvinsk. And he focuses upon the passage which we read last night in Echa. Zohar Tiskor, remember, remember, nafshi, and my, my soul will, will bow down humbled and, and somehow warmed. So he writes, I'm quoting Rav Finkel as he quotes the author of the Meshech Chachma. He writes, Pirusho, the meaning of this phrase in Echa, Megillas Echa, Kapitel Gimel, Posuk Chaf. Ani nizkar v'nafshi nichpefes me'rov tsar. I remember, and my soul gets bent over, gets weighed down by such pain. But the Torah doesn't say what you should remember. It says remember. It doesn't say remember the Holocaust. It doesn't say remember the expulsion of the Jews from Spain. It doesn't say remember the first crusade. It doesn't even say remember the first and second temple. It just says remember, remember and, and experience the pain. Vikosa b'meshe chachma. So Rameya Simcha, who passed away in the 1920s, the great Gaon, he writes, a person doesn't cry for something which is hopeless. Adam bardas eno bochel dovar avud. If something is totally hopeless, you don't, you don't cry for it. It's hopeless. What's the sense in crying? Elohu maksiyach es libo. You try to suppress your pain. You try to harden your heart. Why waste tears on something which is absolutely nothing you can do about it? However, for something where there's a slight de- degree of hope, it's possible to revive that which is lost. For that you can cry. You have someone who's very, very, very sick, but you still might cure him. So you cry to God and say, help him, help him, help her, help her. That's what the Pasuk is saying, says Rabbi Meir Simcha. Zohor tizkor, remember, remember. Kishani nizkar sh'akadosh baruch omar. When I remember, what should I remember? I'm sitting back, it's a terrible time, whether it's this particular year, 2023, Tavshin Pei Gimel, there's plenty to be said about. Looking back in history, even at current moments, there's plenty to be said about, but we remember one thing. We remember the, the Pasuk which we will read Day after tomorrow, on the eleventh day of Av, we will read Nachamu Nachamu Ami. We will read the words of Isaiah of Yeshaya, offering us comfort. Nechama. If we have that promise, for who Yivnes Beis Hamigdosh on Yerushalayim, I remember. Oh, there's going to be a Nechama one day. Yeshaya who works wakes us up with these words, which we will read in just a few days. There will be comfort, comfort, comfort. There will be hope. There is hope. Now I understand that's something to cry about. If there's hope, so I can cry in the wish that the hope gets fulfilled, in the wish that the geula gets hastened to us. Zosa shiv al libi al kein ochil. That's why I can hope. I can hope because I open myself up to memory. A very, very powerful, powerful, profound statement. If you open yourself up to hope, and the way you open yourself up to hope is by remembering, and that's what Tisha B'Av is all about, Yes, it's about sadness and memory. Yes, it's about tshuva and repentance. But it's also about hope. And the way to achieve hope is through remembrance. Zohar tizko. Remember, remember. And that's, that's what Tisha B'Av is all about. The more we remember, the more we read about the history of the Jewish people from our inception until this very day. The more that we read on all the events from the Churban Beis HaMikdash Rishon and Shani all the way through the Holocaust and all the way down to the Zabaro bombing which killed so many people and, and ruined the life of a, of, of, a, of a baby and right down to today, the extent to which we remember and remember and we open ourselves up to Ashrei Odom Mefache Tamid, remember the words of Mishle quoted by Rabbi Yochanan, always remember and you remember and be Think of the consequences because one consequence of that remembering is 
hope. And I'd like to close or begin to close on that note, the note of hope. But first, let's remember a little bit about the Holocaust, just a little bit. There's so much to remember, so much to remember. I have in my possession many, many books. I've been trying to give some away to family and to friends. I still have a lot of books, and one of my special collections are books on the Holocaust in general, the history of the Holocaust, some of which I shared with you over the years, and some of which I'll include in a bibliography that will be the last page of the booklet that uh, Yocheved has prepared for you and which you can see on the website. Uh, and I have a kind of a subspecialty, and that is interest in the Warsaw Ghetto. There are many books about the experience of the Warsaw Ghetto, and one is this scroll of agony with a picture of a person half starved in the Warsaw Ghetto in the early 1940s. And it's called Scroll of Agony, it's a translation, but it's the Warsaw Diary of Chaim Kaplan. Chaim Kaplan was an individual, not a very famous one, but an individual, obviously a good writer, who recorded day by day his experiences in the, in the Warsaw Ghetto and some of the things that he has to say. And he writes at something that happened on December 1st, 1939, the very early days of the Warsaw Ghetto. He writes, on, this, on that day, a decree, another decree was announced. Beginning December 1, 1939, every Jewish shop and business must indicate its Jewish ownership. The owners must conspicuously display a sign with a star of David. Here, we have been set apart from the Jews of Lodz, who had to put up signs with the words, Jewish business. In the future, everywhere we turn, we shall feel as if we were in a Jewish kingdom. The national colors, white and blue, will flutter everywhere. From now on, Jerusalem will not only crown our every joy, but also our ordinary weekdays, as we get up and we lie down, as we trade and conduct business. Poland, Judea, of a Jewish ghetto, it's Jewish Poland, will no longer be a false accusation. Our forefathers who were experienced in adversity immortalized their sufferings and lamentations. He refers to Kinos, he refers to the Sefer, Eicha, and he refers to all the various poems written by Elaza HaKalir, written by various people, famous and not so famous, written by uh, Aaron Mursky in the 20th century, written by uh, Maharama Rutenberg in the, what was it, 13th century, written by Barbanel's uh, fellow uh, uh, refugees from Spain. Our forefathers were experienced. The dirge, oh, inspire you who are burnt. The, the, the um, kinder which we have not studied today, Sha'ali Sruf of Oesh, written by Rabbi Meir of Rottenberg. By the way, if you look for that kina in your kina book, will you, will you find it? It's entitled Shali Sruf of Oesh. But there's a picture of the grave of our mayor Ruttenberg, which was visited recently by a good friend of mine, Dr. Michael Elman, just really just weeks ago in Worms, Germany, France, Germany, Alsace, Lorraine, that area of the world, where the Maram Ruttenberg who died in prison because he was a Jew uh, in so long ago, but he was buried and we People visit his grave even, even these days, as long as many other Ashkenazi Rabbonim from those times, medieval times, but later medieval times, like the uh, Maharil um, and, like, um, um, and like others, one of whom I'm blocking on at this moment, Chavos Yoyer, the author of Chavos Yoyer, of Yorachai and Bachrach, is also buried in that cemetery. So there's a photograph of those graves for you to look at the, uh, in the booklet. But as he puts it, this dirge has become part of our national religious poetry. This is our poetry. Our poetry is kinos. This is his feeling in December 1939 
when all of this horror was just beginning. We're being penned into a ghetto. We have to have uh, uh, Jewish stars on our, on our um, uh, store, storefronts, et cetera, et cetera. It's just the beginning. But it looks like this is going to be part of our reality. And it looks at like whatever we write now is going to be, um, uh, it's going to be, this is going to be our poetry. He writes day by day, who died this particular day? Who died this particular day? Today, it's an old writer and translator who was found dead of starvation in his uh, loft, in his, uh, in, his, in his apartment building. Next day, two little orphans, orphan children whose parents died or were killed or were taken away some months ago, died of starvation. There was no one to take care of them. They died and we're going today to try to bury them in the, in the Gensha Cemetery, on and on and on. On Tisha B'Av, there's a custom, it's recorded in Halachic Svarim, the custom to go to visit a cemetery, any cemetery, just to kind of stir up your feelings on Tisha B'Av, so that it should be v'hachai no se'ne libo, that we who are alive and well should be able to experience death even by visiting a non-Jewish cemetery, just to come in touch with the reality of, of death, the reality of illness, the reality of persecution. I sometimes suggest to people, instead of schlepping yourself to some nearby cemetery, which is valuable for emotional and religious reasons, read one of these books. There are many, many books, diary, first-person accounts of the ghetto in Warsaw, the ghetto in Lodge, the ghetto wherever. These books were written not long ago. They were written, this particular one was written in my lifetime. And there are books by survivors who lived into the 1960s and 70s and 80s and 90s, and there are still survivors writing or recording their stories. We listen to the story, read their stories. Zohar to score. Remember, remember, and you will come to experience hope. I'd like to move toward a closing and close with words and songs of hope. I have in my hand a small book by a very special person who passed away not very long ago but within recent years. And his name was Rabbi Maurice Lamb, L-A-M-M. -M. He was the brother, it's not fair often to praise and describe a person because I had a great brother. You know, you're okay, but this nice brother is really great. Well, this man, Rabbi Maurice Lamb's brother was Rabbi Dr. Norman Lamb, the president of Yeshiva University and the great writer, Talmud Chacham, author, etc whom we eulogized a couple of years ago, who was eulogized by his own son on this webcast. Maurice Lamb, the younger brother, was a man who had very many difficulties in his life, physical illness, etc. But he wrote the, many books. He wrote the book on, on uh, death and mourning and from a halakhic perspective. And he wrote a little book called The Power of Hope, The Power of Hope. And he gives many, many interesting bits of advice for a person who is seeking to build his or her powers of being hopeful, of hoping. For example, he gives us a page in the book. It's on, the title of the book is The Power of Hope. I'm sure you can get it online or in your local bookstore. On page 52, he has a couple of pieces of advice for conquering the fear of hope. He begins, keep this list near you at all times. Keep this list near you at all times. You might tack it to the bulletin board, those of you who have bulletin boards, or tuck it into a corner of your mirror. Take it to heart. Do as it says. This is a man who lived a difficult life but remained hopeful, as I can testify, throughout his life. Do as it says. It can move you in the right direction. Number one. I am the hero of my own life story. I will behave like one. All right. You've got to be yourself. You've got to realize that you are important. It's not arrogance. It's not gaiva. It's not false pride to think of yourself as your own hero. You are the hero of your life story, number one. Number two, I won't dwell upon the past. The past is over. On Tisha B'Av, you can dwell upon the past. Think about the past. Remember the past, as we just saw the Pesach in Eicha and the explanation of, of the uh, Meshech 
But Rabbi Dr. Maurice Lamb is telling us, don't dwell upon the past. Next, I will be the one, the only one in charge of my future. I've got to do what I've got to do. I will be patient. Nothing happens all at once. Uh, not be passive. Patience is not the same as passivity. You do what you can. Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, Zechat Tzadik Levrocha, whom I knew well personally, distinguishes in one of his books between pessimism and hope. He says pessimism is the feeling that everything will be all right. It will be well. Hope is the belief that I can make things right. I can do things. I can accomplish nothing. I can solve problems. I can resolve issues. Hope comes with the, not only with the belief, with the feeling that it will be good, but it's with a commitment to making things better. That's hope. I will trust in a higher power, it's the God above, to help me along the way, and I will trust in myself. These are words of a wise man and, and worth taking to heart. It's become my custom over the course of doing these various presentations to end on the note of a song. And I want to convey to you the teaching of a great man, happened to have been my, my wife's, Chavi's grandfather, of Shol Yadidya Loza Taub, the Majitsa Rebbe, the second Majitsa Rebbe who passed away in 1947. One of his themes is the importance of song. That was what him and the Hasidus he led believed in. Song, 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 even in difficult moments. Habocher b'shirei zimra. We believe in the God who has chosen song, shira v'zimra. That's the royal road to connect to God. That's one of the teachings of this type of Hasidus. And that was our grandfather's teaching. One of the things he points out is, we learned in Parshas B'Shalach, in the Shira Sayyam, the Jews are crossing the, the sea, and they cross the sea victoriously, and, and the enemy is under the water, done for, and we are alive and well. So we sing a song, Az Yashir Moshe. Moshe sang, and soon after Moshe sang, it doesn't say that Moshe had any, <laughs> any instrumental, <laughs> Uh, um, support for her singing. There was no choir. There was a choir, maybe, but there was no band, there was no orchestra. But then soon after Moses gives his whole Shira Sayyam, his sister Miriam comes into the act. Vatikach Miriam et Satof Biyada. Miriam took a timbrel, a musical instrument in her hand, and she began to sing with musical accompany, accompaniment. And all the women joined her, not only with song, but also with musical instruments, with the tupimu vimcholot, with, with timbrels, with drums, with flutes, with all kinds of musical instruments. So the Rebbe of Shol asks the question, it's contained in his Sefer Imre Shol and quoted by many, many, many followers of his. And that is, where on earth did Miriam and the women have musical instruments? They just came out of Egypt, they crossed the Red Sea, they're running away from the enemy, et cetera, et cetera. And they had instruments with them. Or maybe they had some bread, they had matzah with them. Okay, we know that. But they had musical instruments, how, how can that be? How could they have had musical instruments? But the Rebbe answers, it's very simple. And this is the greatness of Jewish women and of great Jews throughout history. In the worst of times, they realize Today, we may be really downtrodden and really in bad shape, but tomorrow we will sing. And since tomorrow we will sing, we have to take along musical instruments with us, even into the desert, even into the unknown, even into the worst of times. We will take music with us, take music with us. The, a photograph I've been trying to obtain a copy of, it's to be found in the museum in Israel, known as the Museum Shem Olam which is a museum on, on, about Holocaust, Holocaust uh, artifacts. And there's a, a, a photograph there of the possessions of a woman who obviously was herself a musician. She has in her release a few cl some clothing, some bread that she hoped to be able to survive on when she was being taken away to one horrible place or another. 
and she had the, her musical instruments, the compositions, the songs that she wrote, she had the sheet music with her in that one valise that she could carry with us, her into Treblinka or into Belzec or into Auschwitz or whoever she was sent. That's the power of music, it's so powerful. <clears throat> the Rebbe, Madjus Rebbe, in one of his songs, which he wrote during the Holocaust when he was, Baruch Hashem, saved and found sanctuary in the United States, but his own chassidim, his own relatives, his own children and grandchildren were being sent to the furnaces in Treblinka. So he wrote a song to these words. They're words in, in, in Tachnon, you can find them in the Siddur. Habet mishamayim ure'e. God look down from heaven and see. Ki hayinu lag vokeles bagoyim. We have become a mockery among nations. Ki hayinu lag vokeles bagoyim. Necheshavnu katzon yuvo. We are like sheep led to the slaughter. Nevertheless, v'shim cholo shochachnu. We have not forgotten your name. Don't forget us. Speaking about remembering and forgetting. The song went like this. You may have noticed my voice is not what it once was. You'll excuse that. The song went this way. Uh, and I'm going to say it in his uh, Havara, in his uh, pronunciation of Hebrew, which is a little different from mine and maybe from yours. Habayit mi shomayim ur'ay Habayit mi shomayim ur'ay Ki hoyinu lagvo keles Lagvo keles bagoyim Necheshavnu Katsoin la tevach yuvo, necheshavnu. Katsoin la tevach yuvo, laharog uliabein. Ulemako, oh yulecherpo, necheshavnu. Katzon la tevach yuvo, necheshavnu. Katzon la tevach yuvo, a sheep to the slaughter. La haroi ula bei ula mako ayu lecherpo. Oy 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 oy, ovechol ezois. Nevertheless. Shim Cholohi Shochnu, we have not forgotten your name. Oh, you know, no, 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 Al Tishkocheinu, please don't forget us. No, 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 Al Tishkocheinu. We come to hope at the song. Yes, Ravi's grandfather and the other rabbeim of Wajits and many, many Hasidic rabbis and many, many great singers of Israel down to this day have sung beautiful songs. But there's one who died not long before the Holocaust, the 1930s. And he was the chazan, the cantor, Yosele Rosenblatt, Zichrona Levrocha. And Zechrona Levrocha, he composed many, many, many beautiful songs. One was, he was in Eretz Israel in his last days. He was visiting Israel. It was then Palestine. And he uh, was asked, I'm not sure just who asked him, but the state of Israel was not yet founded. But it was being conceived of. It was being thought about. It was being planned, and someone realized if we're going to have a state of Israel, which did happen some 10, 15 years after this little story, uh, but people said to him, you know, we're going to need a, a national anthem. Every good country has a national anthem, although I discovered that not every, case, not every nation has a national anthem. But most do, the United States of America does. 
England does, France for sure. So what's going to be the um, national anthem for the people of Israel? So he thought of a suggestion for the words, and he wrote music to those words. The words were, instead of the words that we do have in the national anthem, which were wrote words written by an ordinary human being, a staunch Zionist poet, Hatikva, Kalod Baleva, etc., the, 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 the song of Hatikva. Those words are not uh, biblical words. The words of a, quote, ordinary but very skilled poet. He suggested the words of Shir Hamalos, the Shuv Hashem Shiva Sion Hayinu Kachomen, the words that I quoted earlier today, how we've become dreamers. And the entire verse, which you know from Shir Hamalos, which you sing before the Birch HaSamazon, especially on a Shabbos or a Yom Tov, and he set this tune, this, uh, these words to music, and you'll hear the music, you know the music, most of you, because we sing this tune often, but very few of us know that it was written by Yasala Rosenblatt, the cantor, as a potential uh, candidate to be the anthem for the Jewish people when they achieve a state as they did in 1948. And this is just a selection of that Shir Hamalos and of his words, his tune, his melody. Shir Hamalos Vishuv Adonai Ez Shivas Tzion Hoyinu Kichomer Az Yimolei Zichovok Pinu Ulishoneinu Rino Az Yom Ruvagoyim Higdil Adonai Lasos Simele Higdil Adonai Lasos Simonu Hoyinu Simechim Notice the words, that's so appropriate for a national anthem. We will remember our exile, then we will laugh with a full, full laugh, then we will sing, then all the people on earth would say that God did a great thing for these people. God will have done a great thing for us. We have become happy. And then we go on to say, Hazorim Bedimo, and to sing, those who have planted in tears, when they planted and they worked so hard to build this nation, to return to this land, we've shed many a tear. We were then planting. Berino Yiktsoru, when we will harvest, we will harvest with song. At harvest time, we will not be crying. No more tears. At harvest time, we will we'll be singing. There was a Hasidic Rebbe, I believe it was the Rebbe of Radomsk, of Radomsk, who said that we're punctuating it all wrong. We're punctuating it, Hazorim Bedimo, those who plant in, with tears, stop, Berina Yiktsoru, with song, with Rina, with song, will they harvest, will they reap? He says, no. Take that comma after Bedimo and move it to Berina. So that it reads, Hazorim Bedima Berina. Those who, when they plant and toil and work hard and suffer to create something, to build something, do so with tears and song. Gilu Birada, all right? With respect and with awe and with seriousness and with simultaneously with song. It's not first tears and then song. It's planting and harvesting and working so hard, putting in so much effort and work, bedima berina, with tears of song, with a song of tears, mixed together, song and tears. Then, yiktsoru, if you plant with song and with tears, with dima and rina, then yiktsoru. So, as he would sing, Yasla Rosenblatt, 
with a, a, a possible national anthem for a country not yet established. So if this little uh, shetel is correct, then Hazorim Bedima Berina, those who plant and exert effort and try very hard with tears and with song, the time will come. They may cry for a while, Halach Yelech Uvacho, but eventually, Bo Yavo, they will arrive at their destination, Berina, just with song. Gone are the tears. Mocha Hashem Elokim Dima. The tears are gone, and all that's left is the song. May the work that we do on Tisha B'Av, the physical fasting, the introspection, the memory, memory above all, Zohar Tiskar, will lead us to a place of hope and to a place of song. Thanks for listening.